Yes, kia ora whanau. Welcome back into today's review of round 27. It's the NRL and it's finals, baby. How good? It's September footy. The only place you want to be when it comes to rugby league is in here listening to myself and normally Willie, but the koro is not him here today. <laughs> Um, he's in Townsville, but we have him online. And of course, the show doesn't go on. It just goes on because we have our boys here. So, hey, Ethram, Dills, and our man, Koro Urumu, is here in studio. What's up, guys? Kia ora whanau. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, what an awesome weekend again. Looking forward to the finals coming up, man. It's going to be huge. That's, have you got anything? That's fire. And the flame comes out of my hand. <laughs> That's fire. Anyways, enough of me being an egg and talking, listening to Willie. But if from what's our show, what do we got? Um, well, we'll start off with the news as per usual. Uh, starting off with some, you know, mellow news. Two boys retiring, Aaron Woods and Brad Parker. Bit different in uh, where they are in their careers at the moment. Obviously, Aaron Woods, 270 games, 14 seasons. That's a pretty long career. Uh, he's just bowing out. He's played most of this season uh, for the Blacktown workers. And then Brad Parker, only 27. He's uh, more of an injury uh, forced retirement that he's had. He has had some problems with his knees, uh, so he's decided to retire. You played against, uh, well, definitely Aaron Woods in your time, eh, Adam? Definitely Aaron Woods, bro. Like when you said mellow news, they actually went along with the tone that you spoke with as well. Very <laughs> mellow, very true. Must have had a long weekend, brother. Uh, yeah, played it, played alongside, played alongside um, Aaron Woods, and I think he's played over two hundred and something games, which is a great feat for any player to even play one game, but to play two hundred games in the toughest competition I think in the world when it comes to the contact sports. Um, a great effort from him. Obviously, he's got a now in the media, um, selling the dream to everyone out there and doing some pretty cool things. He's a bit of a funny guy as well, but um, I think it's well-deserved. He's been, uh, I think, a cornerstone at the at the Tigers. He's grew up in, in, in Leichhardt on Norton Street, which is around the corner from the field. And I think, well, he's been able to do what he's done at the Tigers. He's also been able to do some more stuff uh, with the Seagulls, but also been at the Dragons as well. And... Um, a great front row, a young kid coming through, big big hopes, and got through to 200 and I think 250 games in the end, uh, which is a cool little milestone. Brad Park, obviously, it's unfortunate. A lot of the guys these days that they again we talk about fairy tales or the way you want to go out in, in yourself. Maybe an injury has stopped him from c continuing his career and his football, and it's unfortunate. I think that comes with the game of rugby league and. Um, another good player, I think, for Manly, and, and he's been a solid centre for them as well. And uh, it's disappointing, but time must come to an end. And, you know, we celebrate a couple of, um, you know, legends of rugby league. Yeah, Aaron Woods, uh, we get to celebrate a fantastic career and a, and a character of the game. He was uh, someone who liked to play. And I, I don't know him personally, but what came across for me watching him for so long was he seemed underneath it all, a pretty good fella, but liked to play the pantomime baddie at times and step up for his teammates. I remember last year um, he had a crack at Jackson Hastings after a game, sticking up for his teammates. Yeah, That's what the old school front rowers would do, you know. Um, unfortunately, there's, today it's all about handbags. So, But he was still that character. And we get to miss that. 270 games, fantastic career, got to represent his state numerous occasions and his country who, as you said, played a lot of New South Wales Cup for Blacktown workers while signed for the Manly Seagulls this year and found opportunities slim, but he looks like he's already transitioning as Blair, he said, into the broadcasting side of life, and I, I think because of his character, because he's that jovial sort of bloke, I think he'll be as success as that, at that as he was on the field. Brad Parker, I was a, I was a Pretty big fan of his mm. playing in the sectors, the big, yep. the big ginge out there for Manly. <laughs> and uh, Tommy Talal has been great yep. for them this year, as has Garrick in the centres. So they've sort of blocked his pathway to opportunities. But as you said, Ephraim, injuries as well. And as we know from retiring, there is a lot of life after the game, after you finish. And I'm sure he's preparing himself for life, you know, whilst he's only 27. And he'll move into greener pastures, hopefully, once he's finished. But he's, he's had, whilst not as many games or played state or, or for his country, 
he's had a distinguished and proud career and something he can look at, look back on and, and be happy with. I think the fun, funniest memory from Aaron Woods, um, Willie, is that you would have seen the origin um, moment when he comes running in into the huddle like they all do and he misses it and just lands on fresh air and onto the ground. <laughs> One of the funniest moments and um, I was only just left the Tigers at that stage and obviously I still had a good relationship with Woodsy and um, I watched that and I thought it was the funniest thing I've ever seen in a long time. Eh? And everyone still does it to this day but that moment I think in origin will stay in there for a long time and it'll be something that he could remember and look back on and go, hey, look at me, what a... What an egg I was then and how funny it looked. It was funny, so funny that moment. But that was the funniest moment when I think about Aaron Woods, uh, although he's played at international level as well. I think I've got some pretty funny moments, I think, as well as what he's doing now in the media. That moment there will be a, a moment or a memory that he'll have for a long time. Yeah, so shout out to the boys whose uh, careers are winding down to an end now. But there are some others who... Uh whose careers are winding up in a different way, moving clubs to who else than the Mighty Tigers. Uh, they're picking up two <laughs> new boys into their Wooden Spoon uh, three-peat team. Mm. Uh, and those two that they're picking up is Royce Hunt and Jack Bird. Jack Bird not confirmed yet, but it looks like all likelihood it, he'll be going there considering Shane Flanagan has said it's been his last game uh, for the Dragons. Uh, you may be working with Royce Hunt pretty soon yourself, Willie. What do you think of those two signings? Yeah, really good signings. They're obviously looking for some experience. That team that rolled out for the Tigers on the oh. weekend were very, very young, and they have been for the majority of the year. And Benji's tried to blood some people like Galvin and uh, the Fainu brothers, who are the future of of the club and the future of the Tigers going forward, but they need that experience and the old heads around them. I think Royce Hunt gives them some starch. They're losing Utoka Manu to the Melbourne Storm, so he gives them some some of that old head and that experience whilst also giving them some punch and some aggression. Yeah, he's uh, been great for the, for the Sharks for the last couple of seasons, so he's a great pickup for them. Jack Bird. Got stifled at the Broncos through injury. Never mm. really got himself going after winning the grand final at the Sharks. Sometimes when you're a utility player and you're great at playing anywhere on the park, mm. you don't really become a master of one position. And I'm still not sure what his best position is. I think it may be centre or even lock. But again, his experience going to the Tigers will be really, really useful for Benji and for the side and the players around him. So two, two experienced blokes to add to their squad to help teach these young fellas how to be better than they were this year. It's definitely it's definitely the experience for me when you when you have a couple of guys that have played a lot of football uh, and you talk about that team, Willie, that the Tigers run out and, and we've known it for the whole year. They are a young squad and um, Royce will bring some leadership around expectations and but also punch whether he starts or comes off the bench uh, which is much needed in the game of rugby league now and the Tigers need someone like that and I think his energy when he comes onto the field these days is he understands his role as a bench forward or even when he starts he, he knows what his role is and if he's got 25 minutes of hard and fast that's what he's going to bring to the Tigers and along with Jack Bird I guess the knowledge of being able to play sometimes being that utility player uh, Willie, uh, it's a detriment at sometimes at some points because you can play a lot of different positions. So you do just jump around and and fill a gap, uh, but it also can help when you go to the market as well. Uh, so I think both signings for the Tigers add some some experience, um, some leadership, but also a bit of punch both through the middle. And whether you have Jack Bird on the edge, I think he's going to be quality for for the Tigers. What do you think about um, Royce Hunt calling for Benji to consider signing uh, Corey Horsburgh, his former teammate at the Raiders when he was coming up there, and they've had a bit of a bit of a beef yeah. uh, in recent years, but it, he says he's past it now and he wants him as a teammate at the Oh, I, I think Corey Horsburgh would be an asset to the, the Tigers. I think his last... I think his last three games, I know he spent a lot of time in the New South Wales Cup and he's been quality down there. He's a quality, he's a competitor. That's what I like about Corey Horsburgh. He, he plays with his heart on his sleeve. Sometimes you have some brain explosions, but I think you add those two together, you're going to have a fiery forward pack and a pack that you, 
you know, when you have forwards, you want a forward, that, a forward pack that stands up to others. You don't want to just be rolled through the middle of the park. And when you've got a young squad, sometimes opposition, and I'm saying most probably like someone like the Roosters, their forward pack know that they're an older and more experienced. They're just going to roll straight through the middle of the park and test these young guys out. So you add someone like Corey Horsburgh you have um, Hunt there, Royce, Mate, there's some fire. There's some fire in there. Not only is the redhead loves getting stuck in, but so does Royce Hunt. And I think I think it would be um, be silly not to consider having a look into uh, having Corey there in their squad as well, which will just add a little bit more punch as well. And a little bit of, I guess he's a little bit of unpredictability of the way that he plays as well. And we seem like we'll get into it later. You know what I mean? That try, like by the front row, what are you up to kicking a ball anyway for starters? But this is what you kind of get with him, you know what I mean? And I think you don't know what he's gonna what what's what he's gonna deliver. Um, but you put him in a team alongside Royce Hunt and the West Tigers need more experience to guide these younger guys. I think it'd be it'd be a pretty cool little forward pack that they can try and assemble for 25 for sure. I reckon my dream matchup if they were to sign Corey Horsburgh would be the Tigers versus the Bulldogs. Reed Marnie standing up to Royce Hunt oh, and Corey Horsburgh. Two front rowers, time. two front rowers starting and then Reed Marnie in the middle just going, Barry, what he's up to? <laughs> um, next bit of news, Aaron Clark to the Warriors has been confirmed. Obviously, uh, I think it was either last week or the week before I said that there was a rumour about it. And as you said, Adam, rumours do come true. He's uh, signed a three-year deal until the end of 2027 with the Warriors. Pretty good signing, eh? Yeah, good signing. Um, yeah, it's funny in the game of rugby league if you can, you and I can start a rumour, um, Ephraim, and it may come true eventually. Um, and I think this is something similar. I think it's been out there for a while. We obviously know that his mum was coming over to coach and he has family here in New Zealand. He's also played for the Warriors before, so it made sense that... When the rumour said that Aaron Clark would be coming back, it made sense that in Marshall if we can dot the lines together and put them all together, I think that's what we got now. So it's been confirmed this morning. The Warriors have signed Aaron Clark. I think he's a great uh, player to come off a bench. Again, the important thing for the Warriors is working out their bench. Um, they've got some great starting middles, along with James Fisher-Harris, who will turn up with Mitch Barnett. Uh, their their bench is something that they need to be really um, they really need to look into in the, the off season and try and figure that out. So I think he'll add some punch off the bench. The way that he plays, I think this year on the back of his injuries, come back into the the game and it's been really good for the Titans. Yeah, he's he is as we were talking about Jack Bird when he first came in. He started off as a hooker and then played a bit of thirteen. And he's transitioned now, so he had a bit of versatility and you know, being moved around, he never nailed a spot week in and week out. But this year, I, th- I think he's been great for them in, in the middle. And as a starting front rower, he's added that real punch. We've spoken a lot about the likes of Keanu Kinney and um, Kieran Four and Campbell and how good they've been. But they've been able to be good on the back of the great work that he's done. The Gold Coast signed Ken and Palacier in the, in the preseason as a big acquisition from the Broncos. But Aaron Clark's jumped them. He's become their, their number one front rower. With uh, Futueka, um, the both of them have really led the charge. So he's he comes in some really good form. As you said, coming on coming off the bench and taking that Jazz Tavanga spot will be great for them. I mean, uh, he'll be part of that front row rotation. Three years, I think they get him at a really good time. And at his mm. age and how he's learning and progressing, he's just coming into the best years of his life as a front rower. Big pickup, real good signing for the Warriors. And speaking of the Warriors, we'll go to the next bit of news about them, the club awards for them. So I'll just read off the different club awards. Um, jersey flag. Oh, do we want to? Do you guys want to hear the jersey flag players of the year? Yeah, we'll yeah. mention them, my bro. Jersey flag cup emerging player of the year, Ngana uh, Tatafu Vake. Yeah. Jersey flag cup team man of the year, Alvin Chongni. That's my sacred brother. He went to Sacred Art as well. Yeah. Uh, Jersey Flag Cup Player of the Year, Harry Durbin. New South Wales Cup Players Player of the Year and New South Wales Cup Player of the Year, Moala Graham Telfer. New South Wales Team Man of the Year, Eddie Iremia. Uh One New Zealand Warriors People's Choice, Mitch Barnett. NRL Rookie of the Year, Jacob Laban. NRL Clubman of the Year, Luke Metcalf. NRL Players Player of the Year, Adam Fanua Blake, and the Simon Mannering Medal was Mitch Barnett, which I think was probably to be expected because mm. the man did good. Do you guys agree with those awards? Yeah, I think they. Yeah. yeah, every 
every single player from either the Pathways jersey flag all the way up to grade was as well deserving of all those awards. Um, it was a great night last night. Celebrated, obviously, a, a tough season uh, that they, you know, obviously didn't want to finish the way they did, but managed to celebrate a, a, a year of, I guess, um, inconsistencies on the field. But what they've been able to grow outside of rugby league and the Warriors is a lot of the stuff outside of the place, like the Pathways, and we heard some of those names mentioned. Um, the Pathways are growing, and also, I guess, for the Warriors is also the perception from the outside and what they can create, not only in the 80-minute performances, but something like the full-time full -time bar that's about to open up in Kingsland. And I guess the, the bigger picture is how do we keep engaging the fans so that we still get the quality at the games and stuff like that. And you've got to think of different ways. All these these players are well-deserved. Uh, Mitch Barnett, who you could have said in, you know, six, seven weeks ago that he was going to be the Simon Mannering um, medal winner because he's been enormous on the back of his performances to get to Origin and then on the back of coming back from Origin and performing the way he does now, taking over the captaincy while Tohu Harris has been on the side. Um, alongside Adam Fanua Blake and obviously, you know, Luke, Luke Metcalf being the club man, been time on the sidelines, um, has worked his butt off to get back in those positions. So I think all those players well deserve. Jakey Laban, uh, a prospect, a future future back rower for the club. Uh, love what he brings, love what he has done, and he deserves the rookie as well. Yeah, congratulations to all uh, the recipients of awards. Um, I thought Moila Graham Telfer was outstanding right from the start of the season. I mm. mean, way back to pre-season when he got a shot against the Dolphins um, in first grade and he carried that confidence obviously into reserve grade. Played a lot of wing last year but got a lot of opportunities at centre um, for the New South Wales Cup side. So I think he really thrived and, and took those opportunities and looked like such a more dangerous player and got a couple of chances in first grade and, and took them really well. So hopefully he gets a, a few more chances next season on the back of a, a great season this year. Really happy for Eddie Yeramir. Um his ability to go from back row to centre and right. play middle if need be just says a lot about his quality and about the bloke. Sometimes if you're in reserve grade and you're trying to make your mark as a back rower, mm. your best opportunity to get to first grade is in that position, but you're asked to play somewhere else. You can spit your dummy out, but he hasn't done that at all. He's just gone out there, done his job, and every time I've watched him play wherever – you know, he's, he's just gone 100%. So a, a great um, reward for him and well-deserved in first grade. I thought uh, in the absence of uh, the captains for the first grade, I thought Mitch Barnett really stood up, especially when Tohu Harris went down. And I, th I thought he thrived as the leader of the pack and it showed in his performances. Great that he got recognition, got the chance to play State of Origin this year on the back of it. But as Blair said, Probably halfway through the season, even he was leading the pack for the Simon Mannering Award. He was he was leading the pack metaphorically, but also literally. He was just carrying the team on, on his back, and it was great to see him get that reward. It's such a prestigious award, and to, and to get it on the back of the career that Simon Mannering had and what he stands for at the Warriors, and that performance was justly uh, justly earned. Yes, shout out to Mitch Barnett. Obviously, we all knew he deserved it. As much as I'm not a Warriors fan, as you guys know, I still respect the New South and the bro. Bro, like those jerseys you're coming up with, like, is there a reason why you got the Penrith run on today? Uh, I'll be honest, they're the only team that won that I have the jersey on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, moving on uh, to Latrell Mitchell and his band. That's just... I don't know what is happening with the NRL and the Rabbitohs right now, but basically Latrell Mitchell was handed a one-match ban that he had to serve, right? He Obviously, he's been injured, hasn't played since, I think, round 20 uh, for the rest of the season from then. They gave him the ban, and the Rabbitohs were like, oh, yeah, he's going to serve the ban in round 27. But then the NRL said, well, no, because he's injured. Yeah you're not going to serve the band now because you're injured. You're not, you wouldn't have played otherwise. Yep. And now they're in some whole legal showdown against each other. They might be going to court, all this kind of thing. What do you guys think? Should 
Latrell have been allowed to serve as ban, or is it fair that it's been pushed to 2025? Yeah, it's a sh- I think it's a bit of a shambles from and on both ends, to be honest. Um, and I guess the, the problem was that Souths came out and ruled them out for the rest of the year. That, that's where the problem is. Eh? So when you get suspended, and obviously not knowing that these things are going to happen in his time on the sidelines, um, so you are training, but you're mostly not ready to play and step on the field. But I think if it was a f- if you were playing finals football, like you'd, he'd be a chance, but they're not had it, not mm. not a chance of playing. So the problem I have is that I heard that they had three different doctors' opinions saying that he is able to play, able to play. Um, so able doesn't mean he's he's match fit to play. It just means that if he could, if they needed him right now, he could get on the field. But I don't think he would have done enough um, training to be ready to play a game. Uh, and I guess this is where the legal stuff comes in, eh? Is that now the, the NRL is saying, no, he can't. But then you've got three doctors that have said he can. So this is what they're arguing is that, well, I, so somewhat, somewhere in those lines, they're saying that maybe the doctors are lying. But I'm saying the doctors put their, their reputation on the line here. They ain't going to be lying. So. I guess that's what the, the issue is eh, around this legal stuff is that um, he wouldn't have been, he's most probably fit but not match fit and hasn't done enough work to be match fit. He's most probably got the okay from the doctors. If he needed to play in all his finals, he would have played. But then trying to argue that the time on the sideline and doing it now, not later, it's just, you know, he just, I think, just cop the one game and then move forward, move on, because this just becomes comes a problem and a distraction. Hey, when finals football's around the corner, no one wants to be talking about all this off-field stuff. We want to be talking about these games. We want to be talking about how good this competition is. And then you've got a distraction, which will be part of the conversations moving forward into the final series, you know, because you're taking the inner out to, to, to court, whatever they're going to do there, it doesn't help the game. So just cop the, the one week, I reckon. Move on. Yeah, it's an ugly look. It's an ugly look for the game as a whole. And I'm sure this will be a case that the NRL will use as a precedence going forward. And there's different examples. You know, had he been fit, can you use an international game as one mm. of those games if you're you're away? And I just think it, they've got to cop it. Mm. I just think they've got to cop it up and take the one-week ban um, next season, you know, it's too much hearsay. They've already, as you said, Larry, they had already said a couple of weeks ago that he was done for the season. Mm. That he was done. Now, I think the whole situation is farcical from the photo, who took it, and to it coming out, South Sydney's handling of it all. No one really has still come out and taken responsibility yeah. or ownership of that. And I think that's what the NRL are, are pretty unhappy about as well. That you know, go back to when Latrell had his meeting with the board, and he comes out, never owned up to it, never put his hand up. Neither did the club, and what they were going to do to to fix the situation. But yeah, I just think they've got to they've got to take the one week ban and cop it on the chin. It's an ugly look for the game. Yeah, and I mean, it's really just the cap of the season for the Rabbitohs, who in the end fell down to sixteenth because the Eels win actually leapfrogged them because of their points differential. Yeah. So just a really all-round terrible season for the Rabbitohs for their sake, for their players, for their fans. Uh, hopefully they can turn it around for next season. Uh, a different club who almost had the opposite run, the dream run, uh, is the Dolphins uh, and some news on Tom Flegler and his injury. So he's finally going into surgery for that nerve damage in his shoulder, Mm. I believe it is, that he sustained in round five. So he has been out of the NRL since round five. I think he played four games. And for some reason, he hadn't had surgery. I'm not sure why that would be, but he's finally getting surgery now. Even then, Wayne Bennett has said that it might not even work. Work Like, it's just kind of a shot in the dark. Like, we're trying to get it to help the guy see if he can get back for yeah. maybe not even next season, but the season after with this kind of surgery. Um, so, what? it's a tough one. I feel really bad for Tom Flegler. What happens with these kind of uh, injury situations in the NRL behind the scenes that we don't see? Oh, I think... Th- I think- there's obviously rehab involved, eh, first and foremost, and I think the operation is last resort. So if you can 
rehab this and hopefully get, I guess, any strength or any movement in there to make sure that you can be able to play a game first and foremost. Uh, you go that route first, and then the op, op the option the option at the end is the operation is that's the last resort to fix it. And and like you said, that Wayne said it may not fix them. Like it's unfortunate. Like these things happen in the game of rugby league. It is a high collision game, and there's so much contact. He's a great player, Origin player. I think he's an international player as well. Um, and he carries. He he's he's a big boy, and he's an important part of the Dolphins. But, and he's only young. So this is a last resort for him. And I just hope, fingers crossed, that he can get the feeling back in his, his nerve or they can help him so that he can finish playing rugby league. Because I thought, what is, what is he, 20? He, he'd be only 21. Be only 21, I think, Flegler. And it'll be a shame, it'll be a shame if he can't play any more rugby league ever again. He's 25. 25. Young for a front rower. Yeah, I mean, like these kids come through a tough period at the the Broncos through those tough mm -hmm. times. Um, him and alongside Payne Haas and Paddy Carrigan, pretty much, you know, they played in the you NRL know, Grand Final last year and goes on a big signing contract to Redcliffe and started really well. And then obviously gets this injury and now could be career done. So I hope that something, they can fix something or help him get back on the rugby league field pretty soon. Yeah. I'd you can't help but think that this must be the last resort. As Blair is saying, you'd think that the medical team were hopeful that they could get him better and, and fix the injury without having to go under the knife. And they've gone since round five and trying to rehab it and trying to fix it. I dare say things haven't improved for Tom and the physios and the doctors must have said, well, we're going to try and go under the knife to try and fix the issue because we've tried everything else without having to do this. But, yeah, I can't help but think that uh, we've got to try. Hopefully this works. We've got to, hopefully they make it work for him because he's such a, a fantastic player. Mm. He played a big part in the Broncos getting to the grand final. But I know the Broncos lost himself and Herbie Farmworth, but I can't help but think how much of a loss he's been for them this year. How much of a loss he's been to the Broncos and their demise and how much they've regressed this year, but also how much of a loss he's been for the Dolphins and how they would have been in the eight had he been in the side for most of the season. But his focus is on getting healthy and getting right. Um, and then we can start to look at trying to get back playing and mm. we want people to be healthy first and foremost, and then try and get it back to the game. But, yeah, there's no doubting the quality that he has. And as Larry said, at 25, he's, as we're talking about, Aaron Clark, they're, they're coming into their best years, these front rowers, and, and just maturing. But, yeah, you can't help but worry for what's ahead for him and just have your fingers crossed and all the best to him. Best wishes to Tom Flegler. Um, next up on the news, last bit of news here, Willie, you'll be the foremost expert on this out of any of us <laughs> uh the england squad to play against samoa has been or well, they've named a provisional 31 player squad so not the exact team obviously but it does include obviously a few nrl players so i'll just rail off all the names really quickly uh maddie ashton john bateman tom burgess daryl clark ben curry tyler dupree Herbie Farnworth, James Harrison, Ethan Havard, Chris Hill, Tom Johnstone, Morgan Knowles, Maddie Lees, Mikey Lewis, Jez Litton, Liam Marshall, Mike Mc McMeekin, uh, yep. <laughs> Elliot Minchella, Robbie Mullen, Junior and Simba, Harry Newman, Kai Pierce Paul, Victor Radley, oh. Harry Smith, Morgan Smithies, Luke Thompson. Danny Walker, Jake Wardle, Jack Wellsby, George Williams, and Dom Young. Some oh. NRL names in there, a lot that aren't NRL names, which is why we'll throw to you, Willie. Obviously, you guys are going to be playing against them as well. Give us the give us the rundown on the team. Yeah, it's a strong squad. That's Sean Wayne's name. Obviously, that'll get cut down after the the English Grand Final. But yeah, you know, we all know in this part of the world about the NRL players and the quality of the likes of Dom Young 
Mm. Morgan Smithy's has got better and better at the mm. Raiders this year. So um, he comes from that wicked stock that Sean Wayne loves. They're aggressive. They go after it. When they put on that red and white jersey, they're very, very hard to stop. So, yeah, it's going to be a tough, tough two-match series for Samoa when we go across there. But it's very uh, heavily um, presented with a lot of Hulk AR and Wigan players who are the two best teams at the moment over there. Mikey Lewis uh, is the form player of Super League at the moment. There was... They actually played each other in the weekend and Hulk AR went out to a massive lead at Wigan, but Wigan mowed them down in the end in a quality match. And those two are, are by far away. And probably with, with Warrington, uh, the, the best three teams over there at the moment. So, yeah, they, those guys come in with form. They'll be dangerous. Uh, one of those tests, the first test, in fact, is at Wigan. Oh. So, you know, talking about how how many Wigan players are in the squad. There's some surprises. There's no room for Alex Wormsley. Yeah. On the St. Helens front row. He's out, but in his place is uh, another guy who's played a lot of football for England and for Great Britain, and Chris Hill, who's probably not had the best season mm. so far. But he's he's in there for his know-how, for his experience. And they've got some younger fellas around the group who don't have a lot of test match experience, and that's probably why they've, they've put Chile in there. But yeah, they'll be dangerous. They'll be a, that'll be a great series, I hope. You, um, Willie, are you confident that you've got a, a Samoan team that can challenge over there? We all know that it is a, a harder task to go over to England and play, especially for our NRL boys. Uh, the, the matches are ref differently. It's cold. It's wet typically at that time of the year. The game's a lot slower. Are you confident that with the players that you can assemble for the Samoan team that you guys can adjust to, I guess, some of the conditions and the riffing that they have over there, the style that they play? Yeah, and those are some of the conversations we'll have, Blair, mm. about overcoming some of those hurdles and, and embracing the challenge of test football. Mm. As you know, it's a totally different arena yep. to club football. Yep. You know, playing in test matches, it's, they are refereed differently. And everything about going to England for the guys that play the NRL – is totally different. Mm. As you say, the conditions are a challenge. The soft grounds are a challenge. The mm. referees can become a challenge. The crowd can become a challenge. Now, we'll be talking about, yeah, you've got to embrace that mm. and make it work for you and, and make it a great experience. Yeah. You know, and come away with that. Hopefully that plays into our hands, but uh, we'll try and get the football side of it as ready as well and, and put the best squad together that's played well throughout this year and, and hopefully some of them are taken in some of that form deep into the playoffs too. Hey Willie, just quickly, three three Samoan players, if, you would, if you'd like to have three Samoan players to be selected in the Samoan team, who would be the three that you would like to have in the team? <laughs> I know you're only the assistant coach, but if there was three Samoan <laughs> players that you would love to have in your team right now, who would they be? Oh, you're putting me on the spot, eh? Roger Toy Vastashek. Yep. That's one. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jerome Loy. Yep. Yeah, and obviously the, he's the best centre in the world, and hopefully he can make the tour as critter. How good. Up three of the, I think three of the best Samoan players going around. <laughs> so you chose wisely, brother, and oh, yeah, no, all the best <laughs> on that one too, Willie. I reckon it's going to be a great contest over there. Always is a challenge, but I'm sure the team that you guys will get together will be enormous. So I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully the timings work out over here and we can get and watch some of those games. I'm still, uh, what, what about the two test matches only? Is it a... a uh, I guess a time thing, or because of the seasons of the season so long. Because you know, you go one, you go one or you know, you know what I mean. Like yeah. if you don't, if you win two, like they did obviously last year, England, fair enough. But if you go one or, or you win both, good for you guys. But if you go one or, what's what says that you can't yeah. play another game? Yeah, it's not tr the traditional three match series, is it? And yeah, yeah, it could be, could be a drawn series. Yeah, uh, who knows? But. Yeah, I think there were some discussions with uh, the Players Association and uh, about the timing and the mm. length of the season and how it's how it's dragged on. So um, I think that's where some of it is and, and where England can fit in the games. Obviously, yeah. they're like Wigan, it's a football ground and we're trying to move the game around 
around those dates yeah. that are already in place. Yeah. So I think there's a there's a multiple of reasons, a multitude of reasons why there's only two games, but yeah, we'll try and make the best out of those two. Workington or something, I reckon, take it there. Oh, you reckon? <laughs> that, would, that would be an experience. We had an experience up there, Blair. Yeah, oh, oh, brother. <laughs> take him there, I reckon. <laughs> Uh, we can all agree up the tour let's go Willie you guys are going to get it done uh, we're saying that like the game's just around the corner there's still a bit until the game but you know it's time to start getting it does it does come matches. around real quick though it that does come true. around yeah. real quick but we'll stick to the games that are on at the moment which is still NRL games and with that we'll get into this weekend's games starting off with the Broncos versus Storm at Suncorp Stadium and later bowl to the Broncos, man. What a one-two last week's for them. Uh, getting just smashed by the Dolphins and then smashed by the Storm as well. Uh, yeah, it, it was. it's rough for the uh, Broncos, but for the Storm, this is a statement of intent, A, eh, going into the finals. Yeah, rough, rough finish for the Broncos. You know, two weeks ago, we are talking about them fighting it out with the Dragons mm. for that eighth spot. Still everything to play for. And you looked at their last two fixtures. And you, I gave them hope of beating the Dolphins. Mm. And then you know, they'd cement their spot and had to do their best against the Broncos. But they've just fallen off the cliff in those two games. And this one, at Melbourne were just too powerful. It was, it was men against boys for me in this one. Just how Melbourne played. Um, Nelson Asufa Solomona, the way he led the charge from the front. But again, our man, uh, Jerome Hughes, three <laughs> tries, just playing with him down that right edge. Set up uh, Will Warbrick for three tries as well. Mm. Uh, they, were, they were just outstanding. It, I thought the rest last week for the Melbourne Storm, <laughs> we spoke about, about um, Craig Bellamy resting his players because he could do. And, and as is his right, I think that'll be really, really important for them in their running. I, I, I just can't see them not being there on grand final day because mm. they'll get a rest. They got a rest last week. They're fired this week. They'll go again next week. I get, I picked them to win against mm. the Sharks. Yeah. But then they get another. They get another rest. So after a long season, they get two really vital periods to rest, recuperate, focus, and then go at it at the grand final. I just. I think the timing of everything is on Melbourne's side. Yeah, you talk about rest. I think um, Cameron Munster had a rest out there too because he just allowed Jerome Hughes to do what he did. And I think I heard him after the game speak about, you know, it's a little bit like the NBA. You know, if someone's hot, you just give them the ball. And I think that's what, you know, he did in, in that game. Like he was... Jerome Hughes was on fire and the money just gave him the ball every time and let him allow. I think in, in the game early in the first, I think they said he only had two runs, but Jerome Hughes was doing everything. And like you said, Willie, I think they've worked it out. They've timed it perfectly with resting players and then playing a game and then obviously, uh, you know, resting in a game, money resting in a game as well. But, mate, they were, I, I, I call that performance most probably like a ruthless performance, eh, Willie? I think it doesn't matter who was on the field for the Broncos, it, it didn't matter. They were still ruthless in their performance. And you can only play with what's in front of you. And I thought, like you said, Jerome Hughes took charge and everything he did was w with intent. Uh, they played with that intent. You know, Nelson was the same from the get-go. They didn't care about how much struggle that the Broncos have had or where they are on the table. It just mattered about their performance. And the Storm turned up with a ruthless attitude to try and kick the Broncos while they were down and they did that the whole time and um, it just goes to show you know what their club's about and we always talk about it anyway but man they have a strong culture they have a strong connection and whoever puts on their jersey uh, does a great job for, for, for the Storm and you know the Broncos will be disappointed with the year um, it's been you know publicly spoken about about their fall from grace from the grown from the grand final you know and, and 20 minutes away from winning that to, you know, falling down outside the eight and not competing. And at times, you know, they've had their challenges through the year. Like most teams, I think on the back of their origin period, I reckon that's when it hit 
hit the Broncos really hard. A lot of those guys, that resting when they come over to New Zealand, they're losing their game over there. Some of their boys getting injured through the origin period. Reese Walsh and then him trying to get back into form. Obviously, Ezra Mann, Payne Haas, um, Adam Reynolds. When those guys were out, which are your marquee players really for the Broncos, felt like they struggled to find the intent or had no leadership to get them around in the field. And I was disappointed because I think they're a quality side of some some great players through there and play a great brand of rugby league. But unfortunately, and I guess a lack of leadership uh, on the field at times, uh, injuries to, to key players, and then obviously performance and attitude didn't get them over the line this year. And they'll be disappointed. They go have to go back over the off-season. Obviously, they will have their review week now, like most clubs when they finish, and have some deep and meaningful thought around how they're going to do things better in 2025. Because, you know, for me, it all starts with defence and all starts with attitude, and it's get down in the trenches and work your butt off to get to back to where they are. So hard looks at themselves, the, 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 um, the Bronx, but the Storm, ruthless. That's all I can say. Yeah, and we talk, you talk about the Broncos missing players at vital times of the season. But I go back to the Warriors game, yeah. right? When they played during the origin period, they had an opportunity to play Reese Walsh, mm. to play Payne Hunt, you know, to play their origin players, but he chose not to. Yeah. You know, the Warriors had a lot of injuries at the time too. Their form wasn't great. Yeah. And they had an opportunity if they played their origin players Could have won. to get the two. Yeah. They chose not to. And that's, that's come to bite them in the mm. back end of the season. So whilst we're talking about, yeah, for long periods, players, they've had opportunities yep. to avoid this as well. You know, so we're talking about leadership on the field, but some of the leadership off mm, the field definitely. needs to be that too. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was unf- those were decisions that I wondered at the time, are they going to live to regret this? Yeah. And I think they, I think they do. Yeah. Yeah, Melbourne. Melbourne, on the other hand, when they played the Warriors, they were riddled with errors and they went through that period where they were starting games shockingly. Yeah. Mm. But they were still winning. Mm. They were coming through the games unscathed. Now, some teams will be just happy here. We played bad, but we got the two points. We're happy with the win. You know, Craig Bellamy's obviously gone back and said, no, we're not happy just to win. We're going to get better at this. We're going mm. to get better and better. And that's been the case. Yeah. Eradicate those errors. And in doing so, they've just become a real dominant force. Mm. As well as uh, player reviews for the Broncos, there'll be coaches' reviews as well. And you always, I guess as coaches, you always want to understand and have your time back in hindsight is a good thing and go back and think of moments throughout the season that you could have made a better decision or or done something different at training or the week was different, you know what I mean? So I'm guessing a lot now, a lot of coaches right down there in there, they prepare their week so they can go back over their notes and go, what did we do this week? What did we do this week? What didn't we do? And how they can be better, whether it means reviewing their, their own performance. I think that's the most important part. And then obviously getting a feel for the group and having some feedback from the players on what they think that they need to be the best that they can uh, week in, week out to perform. For the Broncos, um, uh, obviously with the downward slide of the whole club towards the end of the season, falling out of the finals and stuff like that, it's been all kind of bad news. And I feel like that's what's caused this thing with Corey Oates. Basically, he's played his last game. That was his last game for the Broncos. Yeah. Uh, Quite unceremonious, just sort of, you know, just sort of felt like another game. Obviously, they get crunched in the game. Is that a symptom of a club struggling where things like that can just like get washed away, especially when they've fallen from grace? Yeah, well, it's hard, eh? Because you're in and out of the team because on your form as well. So at the times this year, I think obviously the players that were playing in Corey Oates' position were playing better and he was going for a style of football and I think I heard him speak about it during the year about like fast, you know what I mean? You had Dean Mariner out wide, you had Jesse Arthurs and these guys were our young, they, they were their younger backs and Corey Oates was coming to the back end of his career. He's had a few injuries through his career. I've played alongside Corey. I know what he can bring. I know what he does. Um, but I just don't think um, 
at times he deserved to be playing because others were playing better at that time. He gets an opportunity to play, and I guess it's a, yeah, like you said, I think it's a, just a snowball of everything that's happened this year for, for the Broncos, as sometimes those things get a little bit ugly as well. And you may, as a player, I guess when you've put your body on the line for a club, you just may want a little bit more to be recognised as the player that's actually done things for the place and actually wanted to be there and didn't want to leave. But I think there's been some conversation in the last couple of years of Corey Oates about uh, the club not wanting to to have him because they're going in a different direction. But this it's rugby league. You know, this, that's a business. That's how it works. And sometimes players just got to realise that as well. But at the same time, you've got to back yourself to be the best that you can and, and compete for those positions. You know, don't just give it up to the younger guys because there's always a place on the field for our older players as well. But if you allow the outside noise, if you allow these others to be better than you, then you might as well just hang up the boots because if you don't turn up as a rugby league player every single day to be the best that you can, you're never going to get back in those positions. So don't allow these young guys to come in, which they will try. But if you've got the experience and the knowledge and the work ethic to want to be on that team, you will do everything possible. So it's a bit of a mix of everything, I think, for the Broncos. As well as, well as they're not performing well, as well as they've been through the ring, as well as him not being selected in the teams through the year, then it all comes down to this one moment and everyone like highlights it because it's like, oh, it's his last game. We're just going to play him. And then the send-off is they're already sad. They're already disappointed with the year. And then it's like a little send-off after the game. So I think Corey plays a great player, done some great things for the club and deserves much be a bit more of a celebration. But anyways, he doesn't get that. Well, he gets what he can be given on the day and um, he still will be happy with where he went in his career. Hopefully... Um, I don't know if Navy's going to keep playing on, maybe. Yeah, I think the writing's been on the wall for, for Corey Oates for a little while. Mm. It wasn't just about this season. This, you know, he was in and out for the last two years yeah. with, with the emergence of the guys like Jesse Arthurs and, and Dean Mariner. Uh, they decided to go a different way last season and that worked for them. That got them to the grand final and they felt that that was their recipe to try and replicate this year, but mm. unfortunately, the club didn't work. It'll pan out that way, and but still, Corey Oates found opportunities slim to come by. But you know, he can be proud of his career. He'll go go on to something if he chooses to keep playing. He's still a quality player and a quality athlete. And still got some size, and if his body's fit, if his mind's mm. still hungry, then I'm, I'm sure he could still offer a club, a mm. quality player. Definitely. Um, one call that happened in this game was the sin bin of uh, uh, Elias Sokotoa. Got sin binned after they pulled it back, after it was basically a tackle happened, the hit happened, then a tackle happened, and then they kicked it. The guy catches the kick, the ref blows the whistle, brings it back to a tackle ago to sin bin him. I'm... Kind you, of you've confused. missed it. You've missed it, eh? Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of confused. What if, if there's already been a tackle since then? Surely you're not going back just to bin a guy because if it wasn't that obvious that he needed to be bin in the first place, then Correct. why do you need to go back to it? Well, yeah, and this is this is the issue again, eh? Is that like what? So you've gone through these whole couple of plays, kicked the ball, and then gone three plays back to find something. Otherwise, if we continue, if they do this. It sets a precedence for things to come in the future. You know what I mean? We can't be going back. If, if you, like you said, if you don't pick it up at the start, then it can't have been that bad that you thought, oh, well, we've got to come, we've got to bin him right now. And then, because if you thought it was bad, you blow the whistle right there and then and go, come, yep, 10 minutes. But after a kick, so the whole time the ref would have been running down the field, he's supposed to be getting comms in his ears that you need to go back and check that. It's gone. You, you've lost it. You've lost the whole thing. Don't go back. It's too late now. You know what I mean? So I don't like that they had to go back to that um, because it's not not a good look for our game. Because then you can go back what a few more tackles. You know what I mean? Exactly. So I just don't think we we should we don't need to be starting that now. So I didn't like it that they went back a few plays after to give him the bin, but that was his decision. Because I'd say yeah, yeah. I'd, we're going backwards. This is how it was when the video ref first came in, and we'll. I uh, remember some games in the UK where we could go back three or four plays after a try mm. and some tries were being ruled out for a play that was three or four tries ago, mm. three or four plays ago. 
but we moved on from that. Mm. You know, it was it was a judge to be too far to look back. And what Blair is saying is correct. Once the players moved on and we get to the next tackle, well, that's gone now. Yeah, that's gone. And this is why, if if something say there's a the ball comes free, and you're fifty fifty whether there's a knock on, but the player picks it up and runs, you hope he gets tackled. Yeah. Because the referee will play on, yes. play the ball, and it's gone then. Yeah. But if you score, on, they can go back. Then we've got to go back and review it. And, Correct. And then we go, oh, bound it. You, sometimes you hope it knocks on, but you can't you can't go back a play after you know two plays ago. I think we're opening a can of worms. I think there's a can of worms being opened at the moment, and, and other things as well. Players going down, and I've seen it. I've seen it too much. I saw it this weekend where somebody went down and held their neck. Referee gives a penalty, jumps up, I'm fine again. Yeah. Nah, the, yeah. The, the play acting's killing me at the moment. The milking of penalties. And then on top of it, we're, we're looking to go back. A play, play before, or two plays before. Yeah, it's not a good look again from the game. Willie, Sua goes down in that game. Hammy. Yeah. You had any contact with the Storm or anyone, Benny Gardner, reached out just to make sure he's all right? He's too many gooses, yeah. I reckon, brother. Too many gooses. <laughs> That's what does, it wasn't the, the speed that he has, it's too many gooses before he gets tackled. Have a word. What do we hear? What do you yeah, hear? Yeah, well, it was the goosey when he was trying to uh get chased down by Walters. It's a hooker, just keep running around. Just... The goose to no one, yeah, no one. But we have a look, it's, it's either the goosey or trying to score a try from 10 foot in the air, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't it you, himself? you heard, heard <laughs> any, got any word down? Yeah. Got any word there, Willie, on how he's No, how he's no, I'm not sure how he is. I'm not sure how he's doing and what he's being diagnosed with, and hopefully, fingers crossed, he's okay. Cool. Thankfully, Pappenhausen's injury was only one week. Otherwise, man, it would be Wishart's turn to play fullback probably and uh, if both of those the, two were The out. bro wouldn't look out of place either. <laughs> Wishart, he's been enormous, bro. Um, moving on to the next game, the Wooden Spoon Bowl, the Tigers <laughs> versus the Eels. At Campbelltown Sports Stadium, massive spectacle going into the game just for the Eels to destroy the Tigers, 60 to 26. Uh, well done, West Tigers. They're the Panthers of the wooden spoon. Uh, three feet on the spoon. Well done, Tigers. <laughs> this guy, bro, bro, you are taking the oh, bro, nah, You're sad, eh? Sad. Ah, do you sad? He wore yeah. the he wore the Tigers jersey a couple of weeks ago, Willie, when they won. Ah, did he? You know, and now he's. Ah, I thought it. he would have had a spoon on his shoulder today. <laughs> I should. talk about kicking when they're down. Yeah, yeah, hard. Uh, yeah, no, this was as I said before in the Melbourne game. This was in so many ways men against boys mm. and experience and talent and quality. Um, I just before the game. I heard somebody talk about uh, there was some good money for Golden Point, and I thought there was a chance. I I never saw Power running away with this, but yeah. the fact that there was 86 points scored in this game says where both these teams are at defensively. Uh, no Mel, uh, no Power scored 60 of them, but still to concede 26 points in a win like that um, just says how leaky both teams have been and. Jason Rolls has got some work ahead of him um, as he comes in to try and steady the ship at the Paramount Eels, but so is Benji Marshall. And this is why I say the experience of those guys that they're bringing in with Jack Bird and Jerome Luai, Sunil Taruva, Royce Hunt, they're going to be so important for them because they, they won't want to go four in a row. They will not want to go four in a row. But they were in at the Tigers. Mm. They were in it until half-time. But they got off to the worst start possible when Cartwright intercepts that inside ball and passes it to Will Penasini. I think they go four or five tries then on the run. and Yeah, you could just see the life go out of the crowd and the life go out of the Tigers. And they, they resigned to the fact that the fight was over. But at this level, those young fellas, and these are things they've got to learn, you've got to keep fighting, keep fighting to the end. As... There was a, a moment there when Clint Gutherson scores. He gets mm. the ball on the left-hand side and he just runs through the middle of the field and scores under the post. Now, the effort from the Tigers was just not there. Mm. It wasn't good enough on that play. The markers, and I think it was Utukamanu who just stopped working and stopped tying in from the inside. 
Had he kept moving, he may have been able to stop Gutherson, but instead he found a wide open gap to walk through. And that's just happened too much. And again, we've spoken about this before, another Sydney. Mm. Another Sydney to, against Cordesau this time for lifting and yeah. taking him past the horizontal. It was a dangerous tackle. But the Tigers, I think the commentator said that's 16 or 17 for the year, which is way, way too much, whether you've got experience or not. You're playing that many games throughout the season with 12 men, too hard to do. Yeah, and I, I think we we I think everyone pumped up this match that it was going to be one of the biggest matches of the round. And every, all this last round's come down to some pretty big moments uh, and this competition has set the finals up in, in, in a light, but also this wooden spoon as well. And I didn't. I, I saw the game go into a, like a, a 30, 30 all. You know what I mean? 30-30 and going down to a maybe a two-point field goal and, and celebrating that way. And that's how I envisioned it to go. But when you watch the game, it was way off where it needed to be, especially for the Tigers. I thought, you know, the crowd was awesome. Uh, you know, I thought the fans turned up and they got amongst it and, and they pumped it up as well of being this big match, you know, out in the West. You know, two teams that have had a mixture of Tigers players through there at times as well. And the fans got amongst it to, to try and celebrate either team not getting the spoon. And they made a big deal about it. It's the most I've ever seen the NRL even speak about a two, a two teams playing for the wooden spoon. But, you know, you get to half time, like you said, Willie, I thought they were half a chance of staying in. I didn't see the Parramatta Eels kicking on the way they did in the second half. But like you said, some soft, or soft, I guess, uh, decisions that some players made not to keep working uh, in the tough times was what was the difference in the end. A little bit, of obviously, lack of leadership, obviously losing their captains or a dangerous tackle wasn't the right thing. I think there was 12 minutes to go or might even just be nine, so I don't think he gets back on. Um, so you lose your captain, who's an instrumental part of your team through the middle of the park, who's been one of their best players this year, and then you're, you're coming up against a team that's can attack, uh, has had some players that have gotten a little bit of form. I thought Mike Acevo, the hardest I've seen him run for a long time. Like, he's, he was yeah. hard to handle with his carries. He was causing a lot of trouble for Charlie Stane. Charlie Stane was doing his best. But some of the carries he was doing, like, I've seen him knock players out with the way that he carries that ball. So, you know, Cartwright, like you said, that intercept, the bro was on a treadmill when he was running and needed Will Pedersini to try and get <laughs> that ball back on the inside to score the try. He gave up. But they were, I guess, in that second half, a class above, and obviously alongside the leadership of Clint Gutherson and then Dylan Brown doing what they do, they had a far superior attacking team than the Tigers. A lot of work similar to, I think, the Broncos when it comes to defence uh, this year and obviously the Parramatta's and all those teams down the bottom. Defence is going to help a lot of those teams get back to where they, they need to be. The defence wins competitions. If you're the best, best defensive team and you've got the best attitude that you want to just keep turning up and work for each other, if that's something that those bottom teams need to work on in the in the, uh, the preseason, that's where they need to start. You get the attitude right down there and then we can see all, all teams in those bottom, bottom eight can attack and play football. Sort the D out and you'll give yourselves a better chance. And all season, we've loved the tries to the front rowers. Yep. Big shout out to Regan Campbell Gillard. Yeah. Best moustache in rugby league. <laughs> he gets over the line and what could be his last game for Parramatta mm. and he gets to kick a goal as well. Yeah. So could be a great way to bow out. Nice. Yeah, man. and he nailed the kick as well. Easy. And Tom Burgess in the next game as well. Easy. Both of them the nailed boys. the kicks. The fronties, they can do everything. The front rowers, <laughs> <laughs> give them a shot. How about this one for Mana? Because holy, I did not know this going in. Probably most people didn't. Clint Gutherson and Kelma Tuilangi both been playing for weeks injured. Listen to these injuries though that they've played. Clint Gutherson's played three weeks with this injury. Three broken ribs and a torn quad. And Kelma Tuilangi has played with a broken hand for three weeks. What the hell? <laughs> they were just, they were bottom of the table and they were playing guys with just... Yeah. Insane injuries. Uh, there's there's a lot of players now and still playing in this finals football series um, that will be playing with a lot of injuries. Um, this competition is the hardest competition when it comes to contact, man. Like, the boys play through some niggles, broken ribs. Like, they're getting jabs just to get them on the field. You know what I mean? It's mostly not the best thing, but this is the game that we play. Um, this is the... I guess this is when you talk about these guys that play 
careers, like I guess like Aaron Woods, and then retire. They put their body on the line week in, week out for the game that they love. And whether it is they don't perform well or they're playing their best or they're injured, they're getting needles just to stay on the field to, to do the best that they can for their teammates. So when a player retires, they retire leaving the game that they love and when they put their body on like that, this is what they play with. And it's unbelievable what players go through these days and the way that they get back on the field. It doesn't matter. I think the similar thing with Reese Walsh when he broke his hand in the game, he continued after halftime to play and then got the you know got looked at after the game. So there's so much courage in a lot of these players that play, but there'll be so many more in this final series that will have a lot of injuries as well. Crazy. Yeah, they're a special breed. They're a special breed, our players, and we need to be proud of them. And this is why we shout it from the rooftops, why it's such a momentous occasion to play 300 games because mm. our game is so hard. But as Blairy said, our players, they roll their sleeves up, they just roll themselves out week after week with things that nobody else has to know. Their teammates know and they know the bravery and the courage that they go mm. through just to be out on the field every single week. But, yeah, that's phenomenal to play with torn calf and broken ribs. <laughs> yeah, just uh, shows how much of an inspiration he is mm. as a leader. And old Clint Gutherson to, to be able to do that. It's, yeah, to fight for the cause to that extent says so much about them. And then obviously, like you guys said before, he was the victim of that Coruscant tackle as well. Uh, so maybe more injuries for him as well. But that tackle, three to four match ban for Api, does that affect him in the Pacific Championships? Is that ban going to carry over? Yeah, so that'll that'll carry over. Yeah. Um, he's just uh, It's unfortunate for Api. He tackles really low under the ball. And as he went up, obviously he went over the top. And I think what made it worse, he carried on with the tackle. And that's kind of where it gets wrong for him. Um, he is a low tackler. Uh, Clint did, he did cut him in half, and as he lifted him to, mostly to stand up, he actually went over and continued to tackle. So that's where he gets and finds himself in trouble because it was past the horizontal. It was dangerous. He landed on the back of his neck. Um, you know, three to four weeks makes sense for me. Yeah, no, this, this will hurt Fiji, definitely. And um, you, know, you wonder why it counts for him and maybe not for Latrell. Well, he's a dead set cert. Mm. He's a dead set cert to be to be picked on the Fiji inside. So it hurts Fiji and it hurts him as well. Um, moving on to the next game, Rabbitohs versus Roosters at a core stadium. 36-28 to the Roosters, missing obviously a bunch of those guys that uh, were downed last week, the Roosters, four injuries I think they got last week. They still managed to get the job done. Not entirely mm. convincing for what could have been the second uh, seeded team on the ladder ended up as third seeded. Not yeah, not convincing really that they're going to be as much of a threat as we once thought earlier in the season, but they did what they needed to and got the win. Yeah, look, they've got so many injuries and that's something we spoke about. So that's going to affect them and how they play. But um, I'll start with the start of the game and Mark Nawanga Tawasi and getting off to the best start you mm. can ever get. Not just in your debut, but as a start to his rugby league career. You know, flies up, he showed some athleticism, and then his next play to get the ball and then throw it back inside on a, on a return play. Um, he's going to be a great player. Mm. Big, big boy on the wing. Isn't like, he? Anyway, talk about the other sevens player that's come to rugby league and how good Will Warbrook has been. He could, if he's anywhere close to that, he'll be great for the Roosters. But I agree. I, they traded shots, traded tries, both teams. I'm, I'm still not 100% impressed with the, mm. the Roosters defensively. Uh, the first try that South Sydney scored, um, there was no connection at all with their line. You had Luke Carey fanning backwards. You had Joey Manu trying to shoot out. Um, Cody Walker picks a hole. They end up scoring the try. Then the next try, Tupanua over Reeds. And then uh, Cody Walker scores a try running through. And at 14 10, mm. it was still in the balance. It was only for a 20 minute period after halftime when the 
the excellence of the Roosters' attack started to come to the fore. I think they scored four or five tries in that 20-minute period that really put them away. But, yeah, South Sydney, they kept staying in there. And this has been my question. I've said it every single week. I think the Roosters' defence is the question for me. Mm. I know so I come back to they're missing some quality players and, and Sam Walker, Victor Radley wasn't out there. Um, but it's still defensively, the system's – need to be in place and you know you've got to have that in them and if that's going to be where they are erratic and not reading each other defensively come the first week of the uh, of the of the playoffs against the Panthers that could bring them unstuck that could bring them unstuck the tight games have really hurt them as they saw against last against the Raiders last week who were willing to defend with effort mm. and shut them down and the, the Rabbitohs couldn't quite present that to them but yeah, going to be tough. The Roosters end up winning handsomely. Rabbitohs had a late shout and a great try to Tommy Tommy Burgess, as you said, to kick the goal and, and finish off his career. 149 games for the Rabbitohs. An amazing stat that the commentators come up with that he's the second all-time Rabbitohs uh, wow. appearance. Wow. That's, that's outstanding. That's amazing. So, yeah, it's a... Uh, Tough one, tough, tough old season for the Rabbitohs, as you said. They finished 16th in a season that, uh, especially after Vegas, people would have had them mm. somewhere close to the top of the table mm. to be at that other end. They've got a lot of work on this, and Wayne Bennett coming in will uh, play a big part of that. Yeah, I, I had, Willie, I had them in the top eight at least uh, with the team that they had on. Um, went through some obviously tough times at the start of the year, losing their coach out of form, Latrell in and out. And then they find themselves getting a little bit of consistency and becoming a bit more of a competitive team. And then in the back end of the, obviously the season just dropped off a little bit around losing obviously Cam Murray, who's been influential in that team and, and what he's been able to do through the year for them, obviously to suspension. And then coming up against a, a, a Roosters team who we both say all the time can attack. Um, when you talk about the um, defensive lapses, I, I put it down to, I guess, inconsistency around these injuries and these people not playing in these positions consistently all the time. And that's one thing they're going to have to be better with uh, coming to finals, Willie. And you said that is that they've got to get their systems right defensively. We know that they can attack and they did put the South team away in that last part of that second half. But if they don't get their systems right defensively, if they don't have a system or they aren't used to something or consistency around those positions, then you're going to have, if Tupanu is going to be the centre and you've got Joey Money doing something else, I think they've got to try and work that one out because you come up against a, they got Penrith Panthers, they got the Panthers, it's going to be, they'll be challenged, those edges, and I think, you know, they're smart enough. I reckon Cleary will be back uh, come, come this week. Uh, and he'll he'll definitely identify the weaknesses in some of those players playing out there. If Tupanu is in the centres, um, there's no doubt in my mind that Cleary, Nathan Cleary will know where he's going to send his attack in. So something that they'll need to be better at is staying in their systems and working really hard defensively. They can score some points, but they're definitely going to be challenged week one of finals against a red-hot Penrith team with, fingers crossed, Nathan Cleary back in the team. Uh, Ephraim. There's been nothing said about uh, Joseph Swilly's tackle on Jai Gray. Yeah, I, I, nothing. I, no, it that, was it was I, fine, I hope, Willie. I hope not because there was nothing yep. more that Swilly could do. I thought he perfect against a smaller man who was going down. He was low. Yeah, he was as low as he could get to yep. try and make that tackle. It was just incidental that it happened to make contact around the chin. But yeah, what else to do? What else? we've been talking about it. And I'll talk about it a bit later, but Jojo Fafita did it mm. fantastically well. A couple of times flying in, get low, and he's learned his lesson from origin. Yeah. I hope they don't get him for anything and he doesn't miss any time because there was no more that Joey, Joey Swirly could do on that tackle. Yeah, that, that was definitely a common sense call, I reckon. And it was a great call because you could see how low he was and when he committed, like his body level lowered right down to literally waist height. You know what I mean? And waist height was end up being the head of the opposition. <laughs> so common sense prevails that, man, he could not move or get any lower than what he does. And if the player slips in front of you, hit him in the head, that is 
accidental contact. That is common sense. It's still contact to the head. It's a penalty because there's contact to the head. But that's all. That's sufficient for me. You don't, you know, you, they, they put them on report because they have to because it's contact to the head. But nothing should come from this. Nothing's come out yet anyway. So I think he, he's fine to play. I think he's learned his lesson. Like you said, Willie, I think he, he put himself in a real good tackling position, nice and low to try and hit him. He slips over, contacts his head and... That's the result. So a penalty sufficient on report. Let the judiciary or the people that have a look at these incidents make their decision. It should be all clear cut and common sense prevails in the end. Fingers crossed. For um, <laughs> Samoa. <laughs> for James Tedesco, obviously another good performance from two tries, 222 metres. Uh, I'm going to keep peddling this narrative that I've done in previous weeks. Is there a chance that we as our, we're all New Zealanders, as New Zealanders, that we are just rose-tinted glasses. We're seeing Jerome Hughes even more favourably, perhaps, than the Australians are seeing James Tedesco. And maybe could he win the Dally M based on their voting? Right. Bro, have you, did you watch I, Thursday I, I night's watched, game? No, I watched the game, but I'm just saying. Yeah, but, like, the Bo wins, he gets all the Dally M points. Like, there's no one <laughs> in that game, everything come off the back of him. So he should clean up 12 points. I mean, points. Warbrick would have got some. Yeah. Warbrick Very well, got some. you don't get it unless Jerome puts him in the positions that he has to be in too, but he still has to compete for those tries. But at the same time, they are created through the brilliance of what their halves. And the seven is a big part of the game. They make a difference in the game. And he has been, and we always said it, the most consistent player in the NRL this year. I get it. The Aussies will be looking at James Tedesco because that's where they want to be looking. They don't talk about Jerome Hughes, but footballers, no footballers, eh? Footballers, no footballers, and footballers <laughs> know who the good players are and what they can do. And Jerome Hughes, although we are biased to our Kiwi players, <laughs> man, that it's I'm just stating the obvious. He is the best player on the ground, and if he doesn't get it, we're riding on the show. We're yeah. riding on the show, bro. I'll be with you on that one. <laughs> Yeah, we've been writing it since the ballot went secret. And that coincided, I think, at the time. Uh, Dylan Edwards was the leader. Yeah. When it was open, and then it went behind closed doors. I think since then he's been exceptional every single week. And the absence of Pappenhausen and especially Munster, he put the team on his back. And he's got them to where they are today. And even with them back, as you said, Larry, even Munster's just saying, yeah, yeah, you mm. do it. Mm. You, you, you've got the hot hand. You just keep playing. I, I can't see how, and I may be rose tinted. I may be with Kiwi mm. glasses on here, mm. but I just can't see anybody else is, is near him for that Dalian. Shall we clip something up and send it to the NRL and make sure they actually? <laughs> but this is our thoughts. They won't care about us, but hey, we should clip this something up. This is our up. ballot. Jerome Hughes has got six votes every single. Yeah, week. yeah, yeah. And I think they get double at the back end too. So, anyways. Oh, hey, do that. Something. We'll make it up if we have to. Well, oh. yeah, that's how Ponga won it. So. Yeah, double points. Ah, oh, that makes sense. Um, you brought him up at the start of what you were saying uh, about the game, Willie. Mark Nwangani to us there. Uh, debut, pretty electrifying. I know you hate it when I talk about rugby, but... In my in my youth, I don't hate it. In my youth, uh, when I was rugby, more of a rugby watcher, uh, I always remember him being the most electrifying player for the Wallabies. Yeah, he was lighting up the All Blacks back in those days, and it really did look that the catch, and then into the quick offload, really looked like, you know, he's got a future because that was, I'm, I'm I just love this guy, eh? and I'm gonna get a Roosters jersey now. <laughs> <laughs> Just because of him, man. He's the, he's the man. Yeah, great great try. Great start to his career. He's been doing some really good stuff down in uh, the New South Wales Cup team as well. Eh? So he's played, what is he? I think he's played maybe four games now, you know, and pretty good way to start in, on your debut. And he's going to play an important part to the Roosters finals campaign. Eh? Um, they are down on troops. And um, if you become a target in the year, you've got two ball on one side, you get him on the other side, man. The uh, options. How do you reckon next year their backline lines up? Because obviously they have Tupo, they have uh, Noangani Tuase, and they have Dom Young, all wingers. Yeah. And then they're losing their two centers. How are they going to? He might. I, th I think he might end up moving him into the centers. Maybe. I think. Um, I think an opportunity when you come from rugby <laughs> is just to play that winger position, so you can actually see what's happening around you, and you can learn a little bit about the game first. 
And then obviously becoming a centre becomes a big part. To, and I think he's got great feet. I think he's a strong carrier of the ball. I think he can make that work. But the decision making obviously is where it is. On the wing, it's a little bit easier to make decisions um, because everything happens around the inside of you and what your centre is doing. So I think he can get it, be out wide, understand the game, be that kick target to jump in the air, but also bring the ball out and carry, learn a bit of the game outside of it, then come into the centre position. So I think that's how it works. Maybe. Yeah. Growing up and coming through the grades, Dom Young was always a, a centre. So that may be mm. where they go. Of course, he hasn't done it in Australia. That could be a way they go. But, yeah, I thought uh, the fact that when he joined the Roosters a month ago, straight after the Olympics, uh, Trent Robinson said, look, it's highly unlikely he's going to play NRL this year. Uh, we're going to put him in reserve grade, let him learn the game. and yeah, I, whilst I haven't seen his reserve grade clips, he must have exceeded everybody's expectations. Mm. And, and, and look, the, we're injured too. There was no Tupo or Dom Young, so the door was open for him. The next bit was for him to walk through it, and yeah, he did that. He did that at some. So yeah, he's he's uh, put himself in the conversation definitely, and a good preseason will go a long way to helping him with his cause. <clears throat> Moving on to the next game. The Dragons versus the Raiders at Netstrata Jubilee Stadium. 26 to 24 to the Raiders. I saw some people calling this game the Miracle Bowl because, similarly to the Wooden Spoon Bowl, how there was big stakes for just that one game. This game had the Miracle Stakes, where if you won this game and there was a draw yeah. in the Knights versus the Dolphins, yeah. then you would go to the uh, to the finals. So the Raiders did what they. Uh, won the Miracle Bowl, arguably with a miracle, uh, yeah. with two minutes yeah, left yeah. to go, as you said earlier in the show, uh, Corey Horsburgh. But well done to the Raiders. They finished their season in style, even though they missed the playoffs. Three wins against two massive teams before this one. Yeah, crazy. Again, we said it about the Broncos. This was the other team that was in the conversation two weeks ago. They sat in eighth spot. They were in control of everything. Mm. But... Yeah, they've well and truly fallen off the bandwagon and that'll be disappointing for Shane Flanagan, but I'm sure he'll take a lot of hope and confidence that he's been able to turn the club fortunes around from where they were 12 months ago with all the infighting and players you know, wanting to leave and not not sure what direction the club would go to. But uh, I thought they started amazingly well. It was a Lomax special. That opened the scoring, the high kick and and catch. And they got themselves out to an 18-0 lead. And I just didn't see the Raiders mm. finding a way. At the game was all St. George. And I could see them running away with the try, with the game until Danny Levi scored. Mm. And the game just flipped on its head. And, yeah, the Raiders started to pick holes in them. I thought uh, Hudson Young yeah. was fantastic for the edge. Just... Picked a couple of holes. I thought his first break, and we've spoken about this, Blairy, the interchange of play between Smithies and Horsburgh, mm. and then final little threes play to get uh, Hudson Young through the space. Tried to show a little bit of a fight, long or goosey. Yeah, yeah, back, yeah. But got cut down. But then uh, when uh, Savage scored the try in the corner, who's been great for them yeah. this year, and I think he's. I think he's a lot better for them on the wing than at fullback. They're Definitely. trying to bring him up. He's, I think it gives him an opportunity to, one, show his athleticism and his try scoring ability by taking him out of the fire of the, the danger and, and the work that's needed at fullback, but still learn at first grade level. Um, when St. George came out and they scored again through uh, what, King Tongia at yeah. six, yep. Dragons still have four hands, but... Yeah, another one who was good for for St. George was Jacob Little out of dummy half. Scored one, made a couple of long-range breaks, but they just couldn't tag on the end of them. They couldn't make the most of them. But yeah, it's, it's, you mentioned it. The highlight was probably the Hallsborough try right at the end. Crazy. <laughs> Wins it for the Raiders. Gets a, throws it on the toe with nothing happening. Gets a fortunate ricochet. Bounced straight back into his hands, and then you can see him like, "How did this happen?" Yeah, and just falls over the win it. And if that's his last game, if that happens to be his last one, and Ricky Stewart's come out and said where he plays next year is up to him. He wants, he said, he wants him to stay. Mm. I can't see, 
after the season that's been him being at the Raiders. And if it's that the Tigers, he goes and yeah, he goes on a good note. You could see how happy the players were. That a, a character that they definitely love and obviously adore and, and care about. They were happy for him to score that try. Great way for the Raiders to finish, but as I said, for the Dragons, yeah, they've well and truly fallen off the wagon there. Yeah, and that, that's exactly right, Willie. I think that the Dragons will be disappointed with them. It should be the last month of football because, um, like you said, they were in the box seat to stay and grabbing that eighth position, and at the time they were sitting there, everything was all theirs to win and all theirs to lose as well, and they really went the opposite way up against some teams, and it, it, like like most of those teams that are sitting around that eighth spot or that 9, 10, 11, they'll go back and look over their season, and there'll be games there that they'll go back on and say, man, if we just done this in this game or if we turned up with the right attitude here, we could have made a bit of a, a, a competition out of this game. And again, like you said, 80-0 at heart, like early in the game. And you just think, you, you know the Raiders will try and fight back, but I didn't see them being able to put more points on them. And I thought the, the Dragons were going to kick on with, with some of the, the skill that they had and obviously Lomax and, and Little and the way they were playing and obviously having Hunt there. But then the I guess the tenacity and the want and the culture that they're still trying to breed down at, um, down at Canberra, put them back in the box seat and fought right to the last minute. And that's what... Canberra, and we always say that's when you think of a Canberra Raiders team, they're a team that you got to play to the 80th minute because they just keep playing footy. Normally, it's drawn it up and are doing things like that in the 80th, in the, the 79th minute, and putting little grubbers in, and you're thinking only he would do that. And when you see Corey Horsbrod do it, and you think, oh, they run a block shape, and he's sitting at the back of a block shape wide, and I'm thinking, what's and the timing was all off. The timing was all off. I don't even know if he had any option, but to think to kick a ball in what is, you know, the most important moment in the game, not to, like, get it to, like, a halfback who normally will kick a ball, to have the courage to do it, then also get the bounce and score the try. Man, what a, what a moment for the Canberra Raiders to win that game because that set them in the eight up after that. They were sitting in eighth position yeah. and they all would have been sitting back behind watching that game uh, last night and hoping for a draw and it kind of looked kind of like it was going to go that way for a little bit there and um, Canberra would have been riding home riding home the Dolphins but at the end of the day um, you know you, they look back over this season Canberra would be happy with the way they finish there'd be so much more work for both teams in the off season I think you know Flanagan has been disappointed the last month of football with them and he still says they've got a lot of work to do we know all teams can attack and can score points. But they've, it's been proven. The fence, again, for teams will be something that I think most of them will work on over the off-season. Um, for the Dragons, obviously, they have signed Damian Cook. I've kind of... Since they signed him, I kind of find it a weird signing in a way because Jacob Little has been probably their most underrated player throughout the season. Obviously, Ben Hunt, Lomax, uh, Jaden Sewer, probably their best three players, uh, all uh, origin, all in the headlines for them. But Jacob Little has just been, you know, tinkering away. I think he averages like over 35 tackles a game. Yeah. He's constantly just in and amongst it. And now they've signed Damian Cook, who's another big name or a much bigger name hooker. How do you see next year... Uh, that hooker rotation. What, what what I enjoy is that it's gonna it's competition. That, that's what I enjoy, because you can only get better if someone's knocking on your door. Mm -hmm. If you get comfortable in your position, you're nearly guaranteed. If there's no one behind you to just keep playing football, and if you're not performing well, then and you're still playing, then you get comfortable. So I, what I like about it is that there's players come into the club that are going to be competing for for positions. I don't think Damien Cook is guaranteed to get that nine position. And if you have an opportunity in the off season to prove your point and say, hey, this is my position, you've got to come and get it off me. So I like it because it's competition. You only like, and like I said, is you want people knocking on your door. You want to be better. It makes you prepare a lot better. It makes you, it holds you accountable. It holds your on-field and off-field performance accountable. So when players come, especially new signings, and for the boys that are already there, they know that they're coming to grab a position and nothing's ever guaranteed in the game of rugby league. But 
I like the signing because it puts competition around the group, which then starts helping everyone compete. And that's basically where they need to get to is competing for each other and, and turning up for each other as well. So I like it. Yeah, and that that would have had an effect straight away. As soon yeah. as they announced Damien Cook was coming, every hooker at the Dragons would be going, all right, you want to sign another hooker? Mm. This is me. And I'm, I'm, I've got the jump to put my hand up for the fight for when he gets here at this moment in time because you said – um, he's the more experienced and the bigger name at the moment. He's probably got the runs on the board to get the jump on those hookers. But pre-season is going to bring out some real good competition out of mm. all of them. Uh, they'll be a lot better next year. Than, they've got Regan Campbell-Gillard coming in and Valentine Holmes is a big signing for them. They'll, they'll be a great, great team next year. And I, I dare say they'll, they'll be disappointed even more so if they can't make that eight next year because I, mm. I, I dare say they put the foot together to put themselves in that position. And you never know, maybe they signed Damian Cook to play like in the centres or at back row or something like he did in some games for the Rapidos uh, yeah, nah. with their injury crisis. Uh, next up is uh, the Bulldogs versus the Cowboys at a core stadium. 44-6 mm. to the Cowboys. Oh my goodness. I know I said I could see the Bulldogs losing this last game just because, you know, they're kind of... But I didn't see this happening, man. 44 to six is just a massive win and confidence booster for the Cowboys and very, very concerning for the Bulldogs mm. as well. Yeah, massive concerns for the Bulldogs. They had no Burton, no Addo Carr and no Cherry. But again, as I said, uh, for the Roosters game, some of it was down to their defensive systems. And it's not about the personnel as such. It's about their understanding and their reading, which will be a concern for Cameron Serrano as they, you know, they they have the home game against Manly, against sorry Newcastle coming up this weekend. They've got some concerns about them. Their last two weeks, they've been absolutely smacked twice, and that's no kind of form that you want going into mm. into the playoffs. But for the Cowboys, I thought their back rowers were fantastic. I thought Hill and Lukey just kept picking holes down that left edge. That eye was great down the, the right hand side. Come up with a belter of a shot early in the game. But there's a real there's a real buzz. I'm fortunate to be here in Townsville at the moment. There's a real buzz around the town at the moment about how good the team are going. And I think it's a real positive mode. I think some people were telling me last night that tickets go on sale here on Tuesday. Awesome. And they're going to go. They're going to fly out. Um, they're going to fly off the charts for the Saturday afternoon game. So, yeah, it's a real good vibe. And the Cowboys deserve to be confident. They mm. deserve to be confident. Full congrats to Kyle Felt for scoring his 150th. And he still not his last game. It's not his last game for the Cowboys, and we'll be hoping that this week isn't his last game either. But, yeah, they're firing. They're firing on all fronts, the Cowboys, especially with uh, Jake Clifford and Dearden in the halves. They seem to have found a little bit of a combination going well there for them. Yeah, definitely, Willie. Um, it's, yeah, great to hear that the the, um, the fans up there are getting behind uh, the North Queensland Cowboys. I think, you know, they go through some... Uh, tough times up there through the cyclones and floods and heat waves and everything and for the fans and for the reward that, you know, like you said, the Cowboys have, you know, have come into their own over the last couple of months and they deserve to be where they are. They are going to be a tough team in finals football. You mentioned a couple of those back rowers and also the halves. Uh, drink water as well. Like they are firing at the right time. They are connecting up. You know, obviously got an origin hooker, Reese Robson, through the middle of the park, and then got some middle players there that just get the job done. Um, I like their back rows. I know we've spoken about it all through the year on this show about how good and young and how intimidating they are when they run the ball, but also a strike weapon for both their halves on each side of the park. So they really took it to the Bulldogs, <clears throat> and normally it's the Bulldogs coming out of the box going after the opposition just with their energy and intent. But I thought. North Queensland Cowboys had were so much had so much more energy than than the dogs and when they played and it looked like they were just out enthusing, which is hard to say because I think the Bulldogs this year have normally just worked hard on just effort and been able to come over the top of teams just for a few 
through sorry pure effort pure effort and everything that they've done between the middle of the pack and then also the outside backs i know they're missing a couple of of their key players but they're still a team that can be threatening like you said i, I think they'll be disappointed with the last two weeks got smoked and the fence has always been i think for them a big part of their systems and structures they never just relied on their attack because their attack pre the last month of football wasn't really there until they played that Broncos game and now they've tried to sharpen that all up. But they've kind of gone, may have done too, more of attack and forgot about the focus of what got them there with their defence and must really put a bit more time into the attack to try and fine tune for finals football. I know that when we get to this time of the year now, it's September football, whatever you've done in 27 weeks now pretty much is left behind. So your performances, if it was a bad performance the last two weeks, Normally, as a, as a player, you want to put that behind you and start fresh because now everyone's at equal points. And it's normally what has got you to where you are is what you're going to fall back on. So I think for the, for the dogs, they need to change their mindset around getting back to working hard for each other defensively. And then when they get those players back in, which they'll get them back, then rely on those key players in those key positions to try and put them in the position to score points. So not the way you want to go into finals. No one really wants to go into finals football off the back of two losses and two big losses, that is, than going up against some, some a quality team. Yeah, the big concern, I think, for them, and may have some news on that, Ephraim, is kick hit. They can't afford to lose him. It was a late hit. I think he just got a fine. Yeah, it's just a fine. Oh, did he? Well, there. Yeah, he's pretty lucky there. It's really lucky because they can't afford to have any no. big names missing out. Definitely. Well, you say that. Jacob Kiraz obviously had that shoulder towards the end of the game. Might be another game with a outside back rotation after their last two. He looked in a lot of pain as well. Uh, but for the Cowboys, um, we obviously did those mid-season picks and the Cowboys have been our worst enemies. So in our mid-season predictions for end of year awards we picked the top try scorer Alofiana Khan Pereira and the top point scorer Jermaine Asako mm. well Val Holmes has scored 64 points in his past three matches and is just smoking the point scoring well run. it's done now because Alofi's the top it's try done, scorer yeah. it's done oh does it not count? No, 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 no it's finished at round 27 so, so, okay. so our, one of our picks that got through Alofi's our top try scorer <laughs> so we got that what was that okay. 20 24 tries oh, yeah 24 because I was going to say if no. I it continued into finals no no it's all done Carl Felt got to within two tries yeah. at yeah. the end with yeah a massive run. A Loffy's try on the weekend just got us up there again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's a relief then. Thank, thank goodness for that. We, we can um, much. we can review and go back over those things and just bring that back yeah, up yeah, on who we, we choose because we'll, 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 um, we'll see how we went. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on to the Panthers versus the Titans, we speak of uh, Loffy and he scored in this game. Uh, at Penrith Park, renamed, obviously, for their last regular season game at the venue before it's uh, renovated. 18-12 to the Panthers, the mighty, mighty Panthers. Listen, we won the game, all right? That's all that matters. It wasn't convincing, but we won, so. <laughs> this guy, bro. And we're still going to win the premiership four in a row, baby. Come on, man. Uh, but, Yeah. Yeah. I think they had to work a lot harder than what anybody ever yeah. thought they would have would have had to in this game. And that's and that's concerned. That's not being disrespectful to the Titans at all. But with their season pretty much done, mm. and the, the Pan having aspirations for a four P, I just think uh, they weren't made to work hard for it. But I, I thought they were really clunky, more clunkier than they normally are. They had to rely on some individual brilliance, which they have in spades, but they usually show a lot more connection offensively. And I thought uh, Brian Tortle was amazing for them. He's yeah. just untouchable at times. He just He's nowhere near the biggest winger in the competition, but he's got the biggest heart. Jesus takes some stopping when he gets wound up. And I, th I thought he was unlucky. Not to be given the try. I thought he actually put it down when the referee said that he hadn't and he might have knocked it on. I, I thought at that time with the scores at 16-6, I think, that could have given the Panthers some breathing space. But they go up the other end. 
the, uh, the Titans that Brian Kelly steals the ball off Dylan Edwards. Looks like he was going to score. That was taken off him. But then our man Alofi pounces on the ball and goes 90 metres yeah. to score a try. And it, and it opens the game up. And it was, wasn't quite won yet. They had to rely on a penalty. But it was still only six points. But it was enough for the Panthers to get away 18-12. Some concerns for, the, for Ivan Cleary. They're, look, they're putting their hopes. And I, yeah. I, I, I'm saying that he, he can be a big difference for them. And he will be, Nathan yeah. Cleary. But he can't be the be all and end all. He can't be the one to repeat it. I think everybody else has got to play their chance. And it comes back to what I said last week: Have they still got that hunger? Are they still hungry enough to get that fourth wreck? That's still waiting to be seen. Right, they got a. They've got a great opportunity, Willie. And I, I, I definitely think they do pin a lot on on Nathan. Um, and I think he he brings confidence to the group. He also helps Isaiah Yo for the middle of the park and also allows Jerome Hughes to do what he does. Uh, but again, I think teams will be able to identify that now. And I think it was only the last 20 minutes of the grand final that it all relied on one person, really. He'd done everything to get them in that game and mostly, and won the game. He was the best player on the field in the end until that last 20 minutes. Um, so I think they did look clunky. Um, but I do think when Nathan comes back, he really um, helps them understand their roles in the team because it just works the way that they do. That's the system that they roll in. So although they are clunky, I think when he falls back into that team, he can help those guys get back into a little bit of their systems and, their, and understanding what their role is in the team because Zayo is the link between both halves and normally chooses the right option. And the threat of, obviously, Nathan Cleary's ability to see things before others to put people in space, obviously kick games and to, uh, to kick teams into corners definitely helps the Penrith Panthers. Um, but again, it, like you said, it's it's hard to rely on one person, but I do think he helps everyone else give confidence to their roles in the team. And you think about the, the, the Titans this year, especially in this game, they definitely challenged uh, the Penrith Panthers, had them, had them working and... Um, they, you know, you've seen Kieran Fraun trying his butt off to try and get them in the game. He was taking the ball to the line. He was copping some hits. And people, you know, were, were trying their hardest to try and get them across the line. But in the end, the I guess the want from Penrith Panther just to hang in there in that penalty just to get kicked them away from them, got them confidence to win that game. But, you know, Loffy, I like him. You see that ball. And I thought he was going to get tackled there for a little bit there. Like the ankle tap... Um, who, who chased him down? Tango. Tango. Tango chased him down, and I thought, mate, he looked quick. He was fast. He got, he's got a hand to him. He got a fair piece of uh, an ankle tap as well, but he managed to like, control his legs and control his body and score that try, which was nice to see for us. Um, but, yeah, I just think another year for the Gold Coast to look at themselves deeply and have a look on where they did things right and wrong. Some great talent coming through there. I thought they were they, they tried. Their centres worked hard. Obviously, the wingers, Jojo, did some great stuff out there as well. But um, in the end, uh, the brilliance or you know, just the consistency of staying in the game from the Penrith Panthers it was a massive occasion. Willie, obviously, this is the last game at home. James Fisher-Harris, 200 games in the NRL and crazy. He, I think... He might only be, I think, 20. I'm looking after the bro. I reckon he's 26. <laughs> I think he's 26. Really? So I'm sure yeah. you'd want to come to the Warriors and hopefully play finals football. And I think he might, I don't know, I think he signed for three years. I think that will get him to 300, close to or four years. That'll get him to 300 if he plays every single game. How old is he? 28. 28. So prime. He's in his prime. He is. He is. One of the best front rowers in the competition, you know, alongside, I think, Adam and and Fish and then obviously Payne Haas. Those three guys are the best front rowers in the competition and a massive occasion for him and his whanau up there at, at Penrith Stadium for, the, for that last game there at their home ground and his last game at home in the Penrith Colours uh, and they had a lot to play for and... Um, they come away with a, a good win and a celebration for the big fella before he... Um, comes home back to Old Town or how about that Jaden Campbell try? Obviously he finally to end the game, uh, to end the season, sorry, he is the fullback. How ironic. After all the infighting of the fullbacks, AJ Brimson and Keanu Kinney looked like they were set 
in the battle for that position. And then Jaden Campbell, because they're both injured, ends the season as the fullback and is absolutely electrifying and holy that step. Was. He, well, he's he, he's sharp. He, he is a fullback too, but I also like him at the sixth position. But this is where the Titans have to figure out what they want to do and what direction they want to go in. Eh? When they've got three fullbacks and the kid that debuted <coughs> the week before, yeah. who's I thought was quality as well for his first game in, in, in the NRL, you've got three fullbacks now that are going to be challenging in the offseason to be the starting. So they need to work out where they want to go as and who's going to be in their halves. And obviously, Karen's not going to be there forever. So you might want to start grooming someone in there now and then get ready for making those decisions. Again, we talk about um, competing, you know, people competing for positions in the preseason. That's where it all starts. So they're going to have to tinkle with a few positions, uh, especially that fullback position, and see who wants it the most. And um, fingers crossed, I like Keanu Kinney at the back. Maybe we're biased again like too, but I think he's a great player and he's he is the future, you know what I mean? Yeah, he's... Been their best fullback this year, and I, there's some decisions to be made. And be, as Blairy said, there'll be competitions throughout the course of preseason, which will help the coaches make up their minds to who they pick at round one next season at, at fullback. But if it comes down to it, it could also be a salary cap issue. Mm. Uh, they can't keep all three, and if one of them is surplus to use, they may have to move them on and if there's a decision about that, which one to keep and which one to move, it may be the highest earner, which I dare say is AJ Brimson Mm. and he may have to find himself somewhere else, but that, as we've spoken about before, is the business that we work in, that's the Mm. business of the NRL, you try and, you can only fit so many players and only 17 can play every single week and unfortunately players get disgruntled when they're not playing and we may have to move them on if that's the case and let them find a happy home which also allows you, through the cap space, to bring some more people in or give some other people a bit more money. Which that would just be a a knife blow as well, considering they just re-signed him earlier this season on that massive contract to 2030, if if that is to be the case. Not saying it necessarily will be. But moving on to the next game, Seagulls versus Sharks at Four Pines, 40-20 to the Sharks. They looked good again. Uh, this is a perfect time to start looking really good again, and they did it. Uh, got the big win on the Seagulls' home ground just before they go to play the Storm next week. Yeah, timely return of uh, the two big wingers, Carto mm. and Carlo back. And were great for not just only finishing, but carrying the ball in general play. They traded tries early, both teams. It was tight, but yeah, I just thought some of their football was far more excellent. They had field position all over the, the Sea Eagles, really squashed them out of the game and played some nice, had some nice touches. I, I love the play, and I'm talking about front rowers mm. playing with the ball. It's a nice <laughs> little tip on play, running a but finds a hole, gets Jack a defender Williams. turning in. The nice pass into Jack Williams for him to score. They had some good football across the park. It got a bit tasty there for. Uh, when Jesse Ramian come up with a, a bit of a dodgy tackle, but yeah, they're finding their mojo at the right time of the season, the Sharks. They're, they're just finding that little bit of uh, synergy and energy at the right time of the season that they had early parts of the year when they went on that run. Nico Hines is back. They're getting a full complement of players back. And uh, Cam McInnes is playing as strong as ever mm. through the middle of the park. and playing like a real captain should. <laughs> I, uh, I give them a real good shout this week, and uh, you know, they've guaranteed to be in week two, yeah. at least of the playoffs. They'll build on some of the experiences they get in the next couple of weeks, but mainly they'll be disappointed again with some of the other teams coming in and not so hot form into these playoffs. Yeah, they they definitely challenged the Manly Seagulls, and I think defensively more so because they played some footy, the Cronulla Sharks, eh? and they played with some intent in the way that they ran some of those lines. Even Britton Nakora, every time as uh, Britton is playing, and I, I definitely think he is the best back row in the competition. Whether he's uh, even if he's not, he's the best line runner as a back row in the comp. Whether it's running under his inside shoulders on an, a half back or just back through the middle of the park, his speed that he does things at 
that is second to none. What I like about it is that he's not just your typical hole running back rower as well. He can come back underneath him. And Sharks play a style of football that suits the players that they have. And the half on Britain's side always knows that if, it, if it's Nico Hines, that there's an opportunity to play him short or an opportunity to go back under. He's always going to create one-on-one -on -one opportunities and momentum through what he does. Whether it's going to be a try or not, he still creates momentum. So I really like, I guess, like I said, the inclusions of having both wingers back. Ronaldo Mulatalo, he's, um, I always enjoy watching him go because he carries on and he's in everything and he can score tries. And um, by having those two back, gives confidence to the guys through the middle park, but also the halves because they become, again, options for them to kick to, options for them to compete along the ground. And they showed what the Sharks can do. And this is what I know the Sharks can do, um, but they would have been disappointed with their game previously to turn up and, and display that against, I think, a real good manly side who can score some points and who can play some football. They just challenged the Manly team defensively. I've seen Cherry Evans come out of line, which he does normally. Uh, I mean, every time he came out of line, the option to go through and then play through the line was the, the go for the Sharks. And that's where he, they troubled uh, the Seagulls. Um, again, Tom Trevojevic, we think about players in the team that can change everyone's mindset or confidence. He's not in the team right now, and I don't feel like... Uh, he, they become more of a threat at the back of things. His, his work through the middle of the park is enormous. Uh, so they do miss him. They're hoping hopefully they can get him back be because next, next week. Um, it is, they're in the do or die now. This, like these games, they have to win. Um, so it's, it was, as like we said with the Bulldogs, you don't want to go in off a loss because now you've got to try and work hard and get that confidence back up to be able to perform. And I'm, there's no doubt Manly with Cherry Evans and, and those boys that can put him in those positions that they will definitely challenge uh, come come this weekend's games. How about this? Yeah, that, even that's a surprise. Sorry, Ethan. Uh, the fact that Tom Trubojevic isn't there and they put uh, they put Kola to fullback. I, it was almost, no, I thought it was good. I put wide. Yeah. You know, I, I really liked Hopawadi mm. when he was playing fullback earlier in the season. You know, I think he adds that bit of threat, and he's a bit like Sewer does yep. for Pappenhausen. I yep. thought he could jump in there and that threat, um, not taking away anything that he does at, on the wing. But I just think he uh, he asks a different question yep. at fullback. Mm. He returns at his speed and his dangerous running. Yeah, interesting for me that they, they put Kola back there and not Hopawadi. Mm. Um, sorry, yeah, that is a definitely a good point. The one that I was about to bring up is this is a very interesting stat. Blake Braley, not necessarily the biggest name uh, Hooker, for yeah. the Sharks. He's a beast. Played his 100th consecutive game, a.k.a. he's played 100 games in a row without right. missing one, which I don't even know how that's possible. To um, I, think, I think Luke Douglas may have done 200 straight. You may want to look that one up too. So I think Luke Douglas, he's a front rower. Um, he's may have played 200 games straight, but that's enormous for any player because that just shows some consistency, not only on the field, but off the field in the preparation to make sure that he's the man every single week. It takes some, some discipline and obviously a bit of luck too because the games are massive. He plays in a position that he's making 60 plus tackles a game. Like he makes some tackles and I think of the last, I think last month or six weeks of his football, he's gone to another level. His his passing game, his running game really helps uh, put the momentum into the Sharks team when they're on the front foot. So 100 games consecutive is huge for any player that plays rugby league, but in the middle of the park even more so. But yeah, I think the other one might be Luke Douglas, bro, on consecutive games. I think he ended up playing up at the Titans in the end. Yeah, that's amazing. Was that four years? Four years straight. But you know, there were times this year when they lost uh, Nico Hines and Braden Trindle, that he had to fall back into the halfback position and they pushed Cam McInnes into hooker. So <laughs> he's still making uh, his number of tackles in different positions and his versatility for the mm -hmm. squad. That's amazing. 100 straight, 100 straight, 200 is amazing as well. But yeah, 100, that's that's an awesome, uh, awesome mark of respect for him from his coaches and his teammates. Yeah, I might have chucked 200 in there. What was it? 194. 194. Basically 200. So yeah. <laughs> don't let the, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story, Willie. Hey, it's two hundred, <laughs> two hundred more NRL games in a row than that's I've crazy. Played, so. Yeah, 
194 is enormous. Front rower, a, a nine playing 100 consecutives. And I, I don't think you see him falling over yet too. So that's enormous from, from him. Um, Ronaldo drew level with Captain America. Steve Rogers on the Sharks all-time try scorers yep. list with his 81st and 82nd. He's uh, equal third behind Andrew Ettingshausen and yep. uh, David Peachy now. Oh, the Is he going to reach them? Oh, so, yeah, he definitely will. Definitely will. He'll score a few more tries over these final series and then flying into next year. He's a try scoring machine, Ronaldo. He can score points all over the park too. And he puts himself in those positions because he's a competitor uh, and he'll score more tries. And I think he will chase those guys down for sure. And there's some, some legends in that club too. David Ooh. Peachy, he's a, he was a young carver, that fella. I enjoyed watching him. Yeah, well, that's amazing. Steve Rogers, that's uh, that's one to be uh, really noted that he's an immortal, mm. I'm sure of, but uh, one of the greatest sharks ever. And Andrew Heating, he's in the, a whisper of, of catching up with him. A lot of it will be about the service of the people inside him. Mm. And... Uh, still feeding him and giving him as much ball as possible as well as uh, Kale Little getting better and better mm. becoming more of a threat to open those spaces and giving him those opportunity on the edges yeah I, I can see him bagging more and more tries over the next couple of years and, and going close to being their record try scorer as uh, Kyle Fount did for the Cowboys this year yeah it's going to be the hard yards. I just looked it up. Andrew Ettingshausen, 165 tries he's on, so more than double uh, what Ronaldo's now on. Could be tough uh, for him, but, yeah, I back him, man. He's all energy. Um, the other thing in this game that I noticed was uh, Daniel Atkinson obviously was subbed on. Yeah. First touch was a try. try. How good. Classic. What position was he in? Because to me, it kind of looked like he Middle? got subbed in as the lock. Yeah. And they put yeah. uh, McInnes to yeah. Well, he's he plays yeah. in the halves, you know what I mean? So a link to the middle, a link to both halves through the middle of the park, uh, like a real good position for someone like that to come on and make a difference. Um, with He's quite tough as a, as a half as well, got a good kicking game yeah. on him. He's a com competitor, he competes, and as you can see, he comes on the field a great decision or a great choice for the coach to introduce him into a time where just to lift up the momentum, go after the go after the Seagulls and scores that nice try just by just being in the right place. Yeah, maybe even have the, have the ability to jump into dummy half and, and play the halfback role because of – but then defend a little bit wider, let Cam McInnes defend in the middle as the hooker. And they could just keep swapping roles. So, yeah, maybe a little bit of lock nine for him if, if they want to, because he's a skillful player. He can do that sort of thing, I think. He plays he plays centre too, Willie. So he's your perfect 14A. Eh? So if you lose a half, you lose someone in the middle of the park, or you lose an outside back, he pretty much fits into those positions. So a perfect 14. Yeah, plus the versatility of obviously both their hookers as well. Um I just like the like the look of the kid, you know, Dan Atkinson. Um, Tom Hazelton and Jesse Ramian both went off injured. Uh, Hazelton seems like his one's a bit more serious than knee. He might be missing for their first game. That would be a big loss, eh? Tape up. They'll be ready to go. Like we, like you spoke about all these guys that have got um, niggling injuries and playing through those injuries. A bit of tape, a bit of mana tablets, a bit of concrete. <laughs> but these fellas will chuck some tape on their legs and then they'll be out on the field there. Like Unless it's season ending, um, these guys will will get out on the field next week and play. And Hazelton, he's a cult hero for the Sharkies. And he's plain mean. He's playing me a big body, strong carry of the ball. He's a target for Nico Hines when he plays short. But he's also got some skill as a big front row. And like Willie mentioned through this and through our whole show that we've been doing over the last few, few months, the middles are now playing with each other. And how good is it to see front rowers using each other up and scoring tries? Yeah, unless, unless your legs are hanging off, <laughs> you're rolling up here. And even then, you may just tape it up. Yeah, and go. 100%. There's no the whole season. <laughs> And miss this. You're going to be out there for the playoffs. You're, yeah. you're going out there. Yeah. It's only uh, the judiciary that's going to stop you. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, because, man, missing him, yeah, he'd be a big loss for them with his uh, try scoring record as well. But we'll move on to the last game of the weekend. The big game. 
who was going to make it into the no. finals. Was it going to be the Miracle Raiders or pro- almost certainly not because one of these teams was definitely going to win. Uh, and that team that did win was the Knights at home, 14-6. to six. They, they quelled the Dolphins after that mean performance they had last week against mm. the Dolphins. They kind of shut them down uh, enough where Ponga could work his magic mm. uh, and they got the win. Yeah, I just thought the real big area they won the game in was defensively. 100%. They stopped try after try. Uh, Caelan Ponga, best defensive game I've seen him play. Mm. He was involved in three or four try scoring opportunities that the Dolphins had and they were just that keen to get numbers to the streets and looked like they were going to score on the corner but they bundled them into touch. They, they were just on and they wanted it just a little bit more than the Dolphins did. Bit of controversy yeah. for the Dolphins had a try scratched off early in the game, which I thought was a try. Yeah. But I didn't see how. Me too, uh, yeah, I definitely. That was ridiculous. Really ridiculous, you know, ruling that Connolly and Lemuelu, who ran the inside shoulder, yeah. beated the next defender. That he, that he did what he was supposed to do. So, yeah, that. Uh, Got up the goat of Wayne Bennett, and rightly so. As, you, as I mentioned, the defence really built their game. And then it allowed Ponga to step up. A couple of really strong moments of brilliance. As I said, as he did 12 months ago, he put the team on his back. Yeah. And with all the combinations of halves that they've been through this year, he just said, give me the ball. Mm. Give me the ball. I'll, I'll run the side and you just run off me. I'll find you in a hole. Even if I have to run backwards a little bit, you just run the hole, I'll find you. And uh, I thought uh, they were much deserved. The Dolphins scored a try through Hammer late on and looked like they were going to mount a fight back, but it wasn't to be. Just a shame that the Dolphins lost Jesse Bromwich mm. late on the, to blemish his last ever game. But uh, he can be really proud of his career and, but they fight on. They fight on the Knights. Their season continues. Unfortunately for the Dolphins, they have to wait another year for a maiden playoff appearance. Yeah, the difference was, Willie, and you said it was defence. Uh, Scramble D on the line was the winner in the end of the day. Like you said, bro, they were they had the desire just to keep turning up, and Kalen was a big part of that and has been a big part of the last three weeks to put him in this position. Eh? And um, you, you, you thought that... When you're watching the game, when it was, you know, 14 nil, still 20 minutes ago, that the Dolphins, with the strike that they have, they was they still were an opportunity to put themselves back in the position to score. But you give that penalty away, which there was a penalty away, which I thought was controversial as well. Um, but that 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 uh, decoy that you, we speak about, Willie, um, the Lemmy Lemmy runs a real good inside shoulder line, and the gap is like that. And he turns, he turns him in to make the tackle. Which, if you're a half, like that you've done, that's what you're supposed to do as you're a runner as well. Is make sure that you turn the guys and the, the gap just closes like this. So he bumps them over, and then obviously they score the try. But I'm like, this is the common sense too. And he, and like Wayne will be that filthy about it because this is a season on the line right now for them. And um, it was disappointing because I would have given that a try if I was up in the bunker. Um, because I thought the back row had done his job, uh, the half turns into the back rower, and then the gap is created because that's necessarily what you need to do is create that opportunity through running hard lines. So unfortunate for for the Dolphins, I had them as the smoky to get in the eight. Um, they done enough to be where they are to try and beat the Knights, but on the back of, like you said, Willie, Kalen Ponga and the brilliance, and I just love them on that two-pass wide shift and then also down the short side, the, the way that he can read the play, not only with his speed and his footwork, but the precision that he has with his passing as well, always challenges the defence. I like him that he backs himself as well, and he always has done that with his speed, but also his footwork. And, you know, he's always a threat when he gets his hands on the ball two-pass wide because there's so much space to work with. But he chooses the option nine, nine times out of ten. I think there was that last... But he sneaks down the sideline and bloody um, Kafushi just comes and lines him up and smokes him. And I think they just got Greg Marju out. But, man, he's putting his body on the line for that club to try and get them into the eight. Now they're in the eight. It's a whole new ball game. Newcastle Knights get to fight another day and continue into the finals football in September. 
Yes, his, not just his skill set or his physical ability, it's his ability to manipulate the defences. And you talk about that short side play where he sits behind the mm. ruck to start with, reads that there's an opportunity, goes late, exposes and brings out Kalfusi and, and gets a one-on-one. They're just fortunate enough, the Dolphins, to get enough on Greg Marshu. But that's just an example of a short yeah. side play that he come up with. But he's doing that all over the field. Yeah. He's doing it all over the field, getting defenders so concerned about him, they have to come out of the system and try and sink in. You read it as a support player, something good is going to come off you. But yeah, tough, tough, tough time. I gave the Dolphins every hope of winning this one, especially on the back of smashing the Broncos last yeah. week. But they just couldn't back it up. And they're, they're on their mad Monday at the moment. Just one more thing on that call that we've all said was ridiculous i think what made it even worse right is that the guy that he knocks into actually gets to trey fuller and is tackling him as he's going to try he didn't impede him he still got there and made the tackle but trey fuller just put the ball down in the tackle well that's why i think you can manipulate this rule too willie is that if you start tighter as a as a half to your back rower close the space like he did make the person the back row run the outside shoulder of the half, which would put a little pre- bit of pressure on your outside men as well. But if you get the if you get the right idea inside the systems that you have defensively, you can allow them to run that outside shoulder line and try and run into them and give it as a you know an obstruction. So we just seen them running the normal line that they always run. They are calling that an obstruction too because he obstructed someone, but also the obstructions on the outside shoulder too. I don't know like. How was he supposed to go through the line? Like, I, there was no space to go. He's just running his actual line. Yeah, we're talking about players going down for crusher tackles and taking dives. We're going to start getting defenders doing that, but mm. Blair, you're going to get you, if you get a lead on your outside shoulder, you're just going to take the dive. Yeah, that's that, this. This is what Wade Bennett said at his press conference. This is the concern that we have. If you were going to rule it this way, and we've said it before. What we want is consistency. Mm. That this is where we're going, and it's a totally different game then. Yep. Um, for the Dolphins, Trey Fuller and Herbie Farnworth, like two of Normal. their biggest weapons, like they were crazy. Listen to this. They combined for 538 metres gained and 25 tackle breaks between the two of them. Ooh. And if you were to put Kalen Ponga's tackle breaks in there, well, he got 13 as well. So that... Between the three of those guys, thirty-eight tackle breaks. I mean, well, what three of the that? three of the best players on the field, eh? Yeah. You know, and they stats speak volumes of the people that they are and what they can deliver. Then, and Herbie Farmworth's been enormous this back end for for the Dolphins and and Trey Fuller. Like he's come out of nowhere this year. Wayne's brought him into this team when they had a lot of injuries, and he is not shy to get his body into everything. And he competes. There was a there's a there was a a point in the game there, they put a grubber in, he picks the ball up, he has to beat a couple of plays, he finds himself out of there. But that's what he does. And I like it. He's a smaller fullback. Yes, sometimes he gets out-competed in the air because of his size, but he's not going to stop working hard for you. He's, he's got the heart. He works hard, he competes, and I enjoy what he brings to that Dolphins team. I'm sure he gives confidence to a lot of the people around him just with the way that he puts his body on the line for these players. Do you think the way that the Dolphins lined up in the last two games is how they should next season with Trey Fuller at fullback and moving Hammer into the centres, Avarillo into the halves? Did you like that more than what they had going before? Well, I think, you know, you go on the back of their Broncos performance at work day and then you watch this one, the kind of the attack was, you know, you want to get to your strike players, which is, Her- which is Herbie and Hammer, but you're more likely to get a lot more things out of Herbie Farmworth and Hammer in the centres. I know, you know, you use Hammer most probably at the back of plays more so just because of the speed and the world he can create. So by having him in that in that line in the centres, you may not get what you need out of him. But then also you've got to try and find a space for Fuller because I think he's a big part of that team and where they go. He's not a winger though. He can't be a winger. He's a fullback. But I guess the thing for, for um, the, the Dolphins with Hammer, if he can... Keep, get reps in at in preseason in that centre position. Uh, he must really play Aussie in the centre position too. I know he played there last year. So um, the more reps he can do, I guess you're trying to fit it into the game style that you're going to play. There may be a threat there for him. 
two good centres though. Yeah. World class, world class. Yeah, I like Hammer in the centre. I like Hammer in the centre and Trey Fuller at fullback. But for what the hell they lined up, the difference would be for me, Kartor and Nicker mm. in the halves. Yeah. I mean, that's their best lineup going forward. But that's up to Christian Wolf. Christian Wolf, the new coach. That's the decision he's going to make. And he gets to uh, pick his own team next season. You'd have to think that Kartor was only dropped uh, just for the experienced head with these two last games. Hopefully that Sean O'Sullivan would have the, that his experience would help them get the wins they needed to get into the finals because he'd been trusted for the rest of the season. Yeah. Before that. Well, I think it's been a long year for him. He's played a lot of games and been a big part of the success early and then went through those rough periods where... He was getting found out a little bit. He's only young, new to his, new to rugby league in his career, short. Um, so I think he'll be better for it moving forward as well. Uh, that was all of the games of this weekend. But before we go home, how about we do a quick preview of the four uh, finals round one games that there are going to be. And we'll just get a predicted score from each of you and then maybe a predicted man of the match as well. So the first one, which is the Panthers versus the Roosters at Blue Bet, which is funny that it's still going to be at their home stadium, even though they had the last game, but whatever, mm. is on Friday, 9.50 New Zealand time, 7.50 Australian time. What have you guys got for this one? Got Willie? Yeah, I've got, I've got the Panthers winning this one. I've got the Panthers. Uh... The obvious one is Nathan Cleary to get man of the match, but I'm going to I'm going to go towards uh, Jerome Luai. Mm, okay, sweet. Any score like margin score? Uh, by twelve. I like it, Willie. I like it. All right, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try and go different to Willie just so it makes it a little bit more fun and interesting. <laughs> I'm gonna go the Roosters, uh, 24-18, James Tedesco to be the man of the match. It's gonna be a tight one. I reckon it's gonna be a tight one. Although, I think the Roosters um, are missing a lot of players. I think James Tedesco, and I know obviously Nathan Clear will be back for the Penrith Panthers, but I just think. You know, just to mix it up a little bit in here on our show, it's no point going the same thing as Willie and just being right, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, last time we did predictions, the ones that you did mix up on, you did get them right, actually. Yeah, you were yeah. seven from eight on that week. Uh, the next game, Storm versus Sharks at Amy Park, uh, 6.05 New Zealand time, 4.05 Australian time on Saturday. Who we go on this one? Yeah, Storm by 16. Jerome Hughes, man of the match. Yeah. All the Jeromes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going I'm going to stick with the safe bet here. Is they go to the Storm. Uh, <laughs> I think they, they win. I think they, they put a scoreline on these fellas as well. I think they with the form that they've got, I think Jerome Hughes, obviously man of the match, I think they go 34-22. Yeah, hard to look past Jerome after we continuously say how good he is all the time. Uh, We're trying to get him deli him too at the same time. <laughs> this is all part of the pitch, man. Yeah. Then the Cowboys versus the Knights at Queensland Country Bank, the game that Willie will be attending in Townsville maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stay up there, Willie. <laughs> On Saturday uh, evening. Yeah, I have the Cowboys by four. Cowboys by four. And drink water, man of the match. Scotty. Wow. I, want, I just want to be different, you know what I mean? I want to be different, but I think, you know, a home game up in Townsville, the fans behind them, the way that they're playing, um, I think you can't go past, um, you know, the North Queensland Cowboys. I'm going to say they win. Um I reckon they, they, they put a scoreline as well. I think you know, they, they hold the, the Knights to, to 12 and they, they put 38 on them. Um, I'm going Tom Dearden to, to be man of the match. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Uh, and the final game, 
the rematch from last weekend, <laughs> Bulldogs versus sea, sea Eagles at Accor on Sunday, 6.05 New Zealand time, 4.05 Australian time. Who's winning that one? I'm going the Dogs in Golden Point. Matt Bird. Whoa. Wins, the field, wins it with a field goal and he gets Matt of the match. <laughs> He's going one point. All right, I'll go against Willie here. I'll go for the, the Sea Eagles. I'll go Sea Eagles. I think it's going to be a close, a close game like that, Willie, but I think they win. I think they win 24, I think 24 16. 24 16, and I go Cherry to be, Cherry Evans to be man of the match off the back of a couple of 40 20s. Some game changing momentums. Ooh. I have to say, I really want to be with Willie on that one, the Bulldogs, because <laughs> I actually bought a Bulldog jersey. You, you, you want to wear it, eh? And since it arrived, <laughs> they've lost every oh. game. <laughs> so, oh. so I can wear it, and the, hopefully I'm not the curse. But, yeah, so I'm with you on that one, definitely, Willie. Up the Bulldogs. Nice, nice. Uh, well, Fano, that's another beautiful episode of Rugby League here on Run It Straight. Thank you to the brothers, obviously. Uh, Willie over in Townsville for always tuning in, man. And I appreciate your time, bro. But that's another beautiful episode here on Run It Straight here in our studio. Make sure you like, subscribe, tune in to all our platforms on social as well. We also are a podcast. So make sure wherever you get your podcast from, jump on there. It's Run It Straight. That's another day here of Rugby League. Cheer, Fano.